Welcome back, everyone, to what I think uh, will, without question, be the highlight of our 2012 annual meeting. As you know, over the last uh, several years, we've moved to sort of a new format where we have a forum, which is about a three-hour panel discussion. Now, if you tell somebody, hey, we're going to have a three-hour panel discussion, you can see the eyes glazing over very quickly. I will tell you, no eyes are going to glaze over today. This is going to be exciting. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be relevant. It's going to point uh, uh, toward the future. Uh, the sort of background piece of this, if you will, what we're trying to achieve, is all of us in the room know that engineering education is going to change. We may not know exactly how it's going to change, even though a lot of us are responsible for that change, but the forces are terrific and they're interesting. We have to involve totally new areas of science underpinning uh, the work of many engineers. Didn't even exist a few decades ago. Nanoscale work, biotechnology, and so forth. We have increased emphasis in all of our schools on sort of a new social contract, if you will, that we have an obligation to promote entrepreneurship and economic development in our states and regions and nations. Just the accelerating speed and complexity and globalization of what engineers do and how they do it is just nonstop, faster and faster every year. We have to worry a lot, and it shouldn't be a worry, it should be a great opportunity about empowering a much more diverse population of young people to become engineers and engineering leaders. And I have to continually remind people, we talk sometimes like this is something that's going to happen out there in the distant future. Today, today, the population of age 18 to 23, basically our college age kids, is 40% so-called minority. That can't be ignored. What do we do about that to really put the welcoming mat out and do the right kind of things to attract them? Uh, we have a renewed commitment to design, production, manufacturing. At a time, that's a very complicated issue. We're worried more and more about large-scale systems around sustainability, resilience, and so forth. And we somehow have to not only teach young people to be engineers from the technical point of view, but to engage society in order to make all of these things actually happen and realize their potential. Then you put on top of all of this, this uh, absolutely astounding set of events over the last few years, two of the major drivers of which are on our panel, you're going to meet them a little bit, in new ways of thinking about and using uh, 21st century information technology in the way in which learning and particularly interactive online learning occurs. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, I think if we can solve all those problems in the next two and a half or three hours, uh, we will have done a great job. I'm going to very quickly introduce our panelists, uh, introduce our moderator, and then he will pick it up and go from there. Uh, you have fairly extensive bios in your uh, packets, so I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But starting right here, our good friend and colleague Rick Stevens from the Boeing Company. Uh, even though his title is Vice President of HR, he has a long and distinguished technical career and has been one of the people from U.S. industry who has really pressed all of us as engineering educators to deliver the kind of young women and men they need. Linda Katehi, uh, many of you know from many parts of her distinguished career. Today she's the Chancellor of UC Davis, and she's been a very powerful thinker uh, both there and earlier at Purdue, and before that at Michigan and Illinois, uh, about, the, uh, about the nature of engineering education and what we can learn to make it better, not only at the university, but at the K-12 level as well. Then I want to tell you guys the most embarrassing moment of my last 10 years. I was down at uh, Dean Kamen's first uh, activity in St. Louis a couple years ago, and he had a group of us to think together about some problems. I was sitting next to, to Sal Khan, and I leaned over to him and I said, I just want to tell you, uh, I've 
played around and looked at several of your extraordinary pieces on the Khan Academy, and I'm just so impressed, and I was doing blather on, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, you don't remember me, do you? I was the president of the MIT class in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> he also gave the MIT commencement address last year, and when our chairman, John Reed, introduced him, he looked back at what Sal had said that year. He graduated as uh, representing the undergraduate student body, and he'd said, we're going to change the world. And John Reed said, well, I guess you checked that one off. Now let's do it. <laughs> We're really pleased to have Chula Thierry with us, who is the founding president of Aalto University in Finland. I think this is very important because all around the world uh, during the last five or six years, we've seen new universities started sometimes from scratch, sometimes by reorganization in, uh, in Finland, in Singapore, in Saudi Arabia, uh, in Russia, in Okinawa. And I thought it was really important to have a representative leader of those new universities who have a chance to somewhat rethink their, uh, their whole organizational structure for this new century. And finally, and uh, uh, last but certainly not least, our good colleague Rick Miller, uh, the president, as you know, a uh, founding president of Olin College, which is really one of the great, I hate to call it an experiment. You guys are way beyond being an experiment right now. But an attempt to really rethink how we do uh, undergraduate education with a real focus on innovation and creativity and entrepreneurship. So this is going to be a great group. We'll be joined in a little bit by uh, Anant uh, Agarwal, who uh, mounted the first uh, so-called MOOC at uh, MIT. Uh, you remember uh, last fall, Stanford started a, uh, a uh, class that uh, enrolled something like 160,000 people. Uh, Anant started one uh, at MIT that enrolled online 120,000 people. He's got quite a, a story to, uh, uh, to tell. When, he, when I called him up, and by the way, everybody said yes when I called him. I'm so grateful. When I, when I invited Anant, uh, he said, Chuck, I'd do anything for you. But he said, I have to tell you, I didn't know what I was getting into. I am so overcommitted. I just can't, I just can't make it. I hope you understand. And I said, okay, I'll call Sebastian Thrun at Stanford. He said, I'll be there. <laughs> so so, so uh, I, I know that, that, that Saul had to really uh, uh, stretch his schedule, and Anand had to stretch his so badly. He's giving two talks at 9 o'clock today, so he's going to join us in a little bit. And all this is going to be moderated and uh, moved along by Ali Velchi. Uh, as you know, uh, chief business correspondent uh, from CNN, who has uh, just given very generously of his time and thought to uh, programs like this of the NAE and a lot of other things as an informal advisor. So it's my privilege, Ali, to turn this over to Thanks, you. Thanks, Chuck. Sit back and enjoy the action. Very good. Thank, thank you, you, Chuck. Uh, thank you all for having me here. You've got a quite an august panel. I'll tell you, I, uh, I knew I had this on my calendar for some time. And for any of you who fly on Delta, I write a column every month for the in-flight magazine. And I thought, well, you know, September uh, was going to be a back-to-school month, and I was, uh, I was coming to this thing. So I wrote this, uh, you know, I just get to choose a topic, and I try and make it timely. So I, I thought of back-to-school, and I thought uh, the title of my, my column basically was, if I could do it all over again, I'd be an engineer. And um, <laughs> uh, I have nothing to do with engineering. I, I have a... a degree in religion from a theological college. Uh, and, and it was all actually going swimmingly. We got a re remarkable response from it. The idea was if you're an engineer, you can get a job, and these are what certain engineering jobs pay, and this is what the future, and uh, sort of my general fascination with the built environment and with the way things work. Uh, except what I didn't calculate was that this past weekend, I was at my alma mater in Canada uh, uh, helping uh, kick off a fundraising campaign. Uh, and explaining to people the remarkable importance of how everybody should have a liberal arts education. <laughs> um, and I, sp I spent the entire weekend hoping nobody read the Delta magazine article. <laughs> but this is all to say that I know nothing uh, about engineering except to have a, a, an abiding fascination with it, uh, a remarkable respect for it. I write about it, I read about it, I, uh, I, I try and understand what our challenges are with engineering in this country, and Chuck uh, and, uh, and the NAE have helped me a great deal with that, and I try and take that to, to my viewers. 
uh, to help them make decisions, to help understand the kinds of things that are important to our economy and our future. Uh, one of the things that I've been uh, harping on for the last uh, few months on my show, uh, I, I'm an anchor at CNN, one, one of the things I've been talking about a great deal is uh, whether uh, a really well-planned infrastructure build could be the driving force for our economy for the next 15 years. Things we need, things we, uh, that will make us more competitive, and how we would go about doing that and financing it. Uh, just recently, I was underground uh, in New York at the uh, Second Avenue subway watching that uh, get built, obviously talking about the money that gets spent on it and the time, that gets take, the time it takes, but what the return on that investment is likely to be. Um, I'm just one of those guys that's fascinated by things. Recently, I was on a, uh, a flight that took off from JFK to, um, to uh, on its way to L.A., and moments into the flight, I heard a remarkable grinding noise. Um, and I thought, boy, we're just not far enough up to have that uh, gear retracting, and even if it were retracting, it sounds like it's crushing a car on the way up. Uh, and uh, the plane started to shudder, and weird things started to happen, and then suddenly there was smoke all over the cabin, and uh, it was right in front of the flight attendant who was in the jump seat, and I said, can I help you with anything? She says, no. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and we subsequently found out that a bunch of birds had hit the engine. Uh, and needed to make an emergency landing. And when I got down, obviously this had become, it was in the news, and I was being interviewed about it, and people were asking, yeah, how'd you feel? Were you scared? And I said, no, I was actually kind of fascinated. Like, I was, I was like, wow, I wonder what they're gonna do now. What's happening? What happened to the birds? And how, do, how does a pilot land and that engine's out? And oh, there's smoke in the cabin. Oh, but there's no fire. That's excellent. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's sort of the beginning and end of my experience with engineering. Um, so uh, so uh, I, I'm not an engineer but I do talk on TV, so I'm gonna try and uh, get through this great session that we've got. We've got a little bit of time. I, I know that there's always a complaint that we take these big, big, important topics that are really central to what has to happen, and we rush through them. We're not going to rush through it, but we're gonna make sure that you and your questions uh, get answered. So the way we're gonna structure this, we're gonna start at that end of the, the room uh, with Rick Miller from Olin, and, uh, and they're gonna talk just for a few minutes. Everybody's gonna give a, a, a presentation sort of of the, the world of engineering and education from their perspective. Uh, then I'm going to open it up a little bit uh, between our panelists. I'll ask them some questions and then I'm going to open it up to you. We've got two guys who will have mics. Uh, you'll put up your hand. I'll find you. I can see you all very clearly and we'll move our way around the room. At some point we'll take a, a, a break, which I hope is uh, going to be 10 to 15 minutes. The schedule says 20 minutes. So I'm guessing it might be, well, well I'm not going to guess. Just go out, get a drink, come back, go to the restroom. Um, then we'll finish off, and then uh, you'll all get to eat lunch. So uh, we're going to have a great session. Thanks, everybody, for, for being here, and thanks to our, our great panel. Rick, let's kick it off with you. Give us, uh, give us something to start with. Well, good morning. Um, I assume this is on. It is, yes. Um, good. I'm, um, I have this very unusual experience of being the first employee of a brand new institution in the Boston area called Olin College, or more formally, the Franklin W. Olin College of Engineering. This is um, the brainchild of the F.W. Olin Foundation, who some of you might know for its legacy in giving away money for buildings. In fact, they have funded 78 buildings on 58 university campuses. My first exposure to them was when I was in Olin Hall at USC in Los Angeles many years ago. Um, their idea is to start over in higher education. They were quite frustrated with the need for change and the slow pace of change in primary uh, large research universities, and so they thought maybe if we started with a blank sheet and simply rethought from the beginning, uh, we would come up with some models that are useful. That was the idea. And I was the first employee when I arrived. Olin College was not yet a place. It was an idea. There were five people, so this panel here is exactly the same size as Olin College when I got there, and we didn't have any buildings or any um, resources yet. And that was, a, that was in 1999. Uh, so what has happened since then, and I'm, we don't have time to talk about this in detail, so let me just tell you a couple of the concepts that uh, we've been experimenting with. We, we assembled a really great group of founding people um, to help us invent the place, including a couple of faculty members who left MIT to join us and three of them from Vanderbilt. Um, we rethought what it means to be an engineer, so we have come up with a definition that's different from everyone else's, but if we come up with the same definition, I think the Olin Foundation would have been disappointed. 
Um, so our definition is an engineer is a person who envisions what has never been and does whatever it takes to make it happen. Uh, science is implicit in that, but this is not exactly uh, centered in applied science. Uh, we're located adjacent to Babson College in uh, the Boston area. Babson is not a science or engineering school, but it's been ranked number one in entrepreneurship every year that there's been a ranking. Uh, and that's not an accident. We're located there because we deliberately want to mix the DNA of engineering students and entrepreneurial business students. And every student at Olin has to start and run a business in order to graduate. So it's, it's a requirement. Uh, in addition to that, the founding purpose of the school, as outlined by the Olin Foundation, is to become an important and constant contributor to the advancement of engineering education in America and throughout the world. And so I spend a lot of time on airplanes, going around the world, talking to people who are trying to invent new universities, um, because it's the mission of the school. So it's one of the only places I know of whose, whose specific job it is to try to uh, promote innovation and change in education other places. And if we come up with a good idea that happens to work, our, our mission is to give it away. Um, so we had this unusual experience of spending two years with faculty doing nothing else but investigating what engineering is, how people learn, and how you might restructure the place. To make sure we got it uh, right, the Olin Foundation said, in their founding documents, we cannot offer tenure to any of our faculties who are all on renewable contracts. Um, our students at the beginning paid no tuition at all uh, because they thought that merit should be rewarded. Uh, we can't afford to do that now. They, they pay half of the tuition unless they have need. And we have no academic departments. And of all these um, decisions, actually the no academic departments probably played the biggest role in uh, changing the culture. We, and I'll just mention three things and then I'll move on to the next speaker. Um, we've concluded after doing some investigations that in our opinion at least, engineering is not a body of knowledge. It's not fundamentally a list of courses that we all took when we were undergraduates. Engineering is a process, it's a way of thinking. The, um, the aircraft industry started in a bicycle shop. It didn't start with folks who had a PhD in physics. Um, in addition to that, we think that student engagement is really the key to learning. Uh, in every environment that we can find, a really uh, terrific person by the name of George Koo at Indiana University about 10, 15 years ago uh, developed an institute studying student engagement, and this, is re this has resulted in the National Survey of Student Engagement, which now has something like a half a million students involved in 500 universities tracks the degree to which students actually learn and retain information. So as we talk about online learning and the rush to uh, doing things out of the classroom, our take on that is that it will be beneficial only to the extent that it results in increased student engagement in their own learning. <clears throat> and the final thing I'll say is that um, along the way, we've done some reading in cognitive science and in education theory and ran into the work of this fellow at Harvard uh, called Howard Gardner, and in 1983, Howard uh, published a book called Frames of Mind and developed the concept of multiple intelligences. He was actually investigating the validity of the IQ test, which he found to be, find a very difficult uh, time finding validity in terms of predictability of what happens in the future. Um, and the, the bottom line is uh, people learn in many different ways, and it's, it takes more than SAT tests and um, mathematics and physics in order to be successful. There are also things that involve interpersonal and interpersonal intelligence and uh, creative intelligences too. And kids all have these, we just tend to ignore them in traditional schools. So at Olin, this led us to ask the question, are we attracting the right people into engineering to begin with? Because most of the people that I know, including myself, got involved in engineering because I had a math teacher in high school that said, you're good at math, maybe you should consider engineering as a career. And I had never met an engineer until I showed up as a freshman in college. So anyway, that's a little bit about the perspective that I have, and I think I'll turn it over now to um, Dr. Thierry.
Thank you, Rick. We, uh, we appreciate this, and as the course of the, uh, the morning goes through, we'll have a chance to sort of ask you some questions specifically about how some of these things are working out and what some of the implications are of, of really changing the way uh, mm -hmm. students are uh, taught engineering. And I, and I think there might be some people who say, well, why did we change it? It's actually working OK. So those will be some great discussions that we'll have. Thank you for starting this off with something uh, that, that's, uh, that's so good to chew on. Uh, let's go to Tula Terry, the president of the uh, Alto University in Finland. Tula. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm coming from Finland, uh, which is a small country in the northern Europe, you know, between Sweden and Russia. And we have only five million people, you know. So, so you have to put a little bit what I say into the perspective of, you know, what kind of challenges we are facing in terms of uh, global competitiveness. Uh, I'm, we, I'm also president of a new university, but it's a university which has about 100 years of history uh, because we are a merger university. And, and this is part of a quite a large uh, university reform in Finland, which has to do with the fact that we have been very engineering and technology dependent country since the Second World War when we were paying our war debts back to, back to Russia. You know, it gave a rise to very heavy industries, you know, so construction, machine engineering, forest and so forth. And in recent years, telecommunications and energy and water and things like that, you know. But engineering has, has always been very, very important. Uh, we believe very much in, in the kind of uh, education as a basis for the competitiveness uh, of a country and also research. And uh, the re reason why we've actually had quite a big reform in, in education system and the university system in Finland is that we see that in spite of all our investments and efforts, uh, we are still slowly losing competitiveness in terms of the quality of the research and so forth. And so what the government did uh, in order to address this challenge is to give the uh, universities more autonomy, actually. Uh, and, and, and sort of with the thinking that, you know, the universities actually have uh, expertise within themselves, you know, if they are just given the freedom to do and, and work uh, uh, according to their own uh, dedication. So I, sta I started as the president in April 2009, and, and, and I rather fast after adopting this position, I realized that actually uh, I'm a president of a university that doesn't exist and even the law, which is uh, accommodating this university, hasn't been passed yet. <laughs> so it was a few very interesting months, you know, when I was sort of uh, waiting for the parliament to pass this law, you know. But fortunately, in, in August 2009, they did, and, and then I actually was a president of a real university. So, so when we've been thinking about this, you know, the, the, what we have in our, our university, we merged three universities, one of technology, then we had one in arts and design, and then we have a business school, you know, which we put together. And, 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 and with the idea there being that, that uh, as we have seen over and over many times, you know, in different kinds of technological developments, that the technology alone does not sell your products anymore, but you have to have uh, most of all design embedded in it. You have to understand uh, the people that are using the technology, and we are very much uh, uh, addressing these issues when you're talking about com uh, uh, consumer products like mobile phones and things like that. It's not like Apple won Nokia, which is our pride telecommunications company. They didn't win because they were technology leaders. They, they won because they could market their products and they understood, you know, what people wanted. And, and, and in one way, you know, the idea with Alta University is that when we combine uh, world-class engineering, which is based on science, you know, uh, and, and we spice it up with design and, and, and business thinking, and we do it in an integrated way, we lay the basis for, for a, a new types of products, uh, which, which then will be more competitive. When we look at the engineering, and I'm sure we will be talking about it a lot here today, is that uh, knowledge is expanding really uh, uh, exponentially. And the way Finns used to uh, uh, educate engineers was that we had a five-year five -year educational program where you start engineering from day one and you end with more engineering until the end of, end of your study period. And what we are doing now is that we actually thinking about, you know, the skills that future engineers are going to, going to need. And I think that uh, we would probably all admit that it's very difficult to, to predict future. So we, we don't really know what the jobs are that our engineers are going to take when they are finished and, and, and throughout their careers. And, and, and therefore, therefore, we're trying to go away from this kind of 
uh, very tightly disciplinary education in engineering, but make it broader, more multidisciplinary. And, and if you think about the amount of technical information, it's kind of doubling almost uh, every other year. So it means that almost anything you know, that we teach today is going to be old-fashioned in about three years. And this is a huge challenge to engineering, and I'm really looking forward to hearing my, my neighbors' views on how, how these kind of issues could be tackled in the future. So, so we are going to broader and more uh, uh, multidisciplinary way of educating our engineering engineers and also uh, very much uh, going uh, and thinking about, you know, changing the paradigm of teaching to say that, okay, it's, it's not the books and the lectures anymore where you get the information, but you get it from the internet and, and with different kinds of discussions, forums and things like that. And then you have to come back to the university to do the discussion and make sure that, you know, our students get the solid base of knowing what is a fact, because in these other media, uh, you can be very easily misled, you know, you, you have all kinds of stuff there that looks like a fact and we have to teach them critical thinking. And then, of course, in engineering, we have to teach them how to use uh, 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 this information. We're using a lot of interactive uh, forums, you know, which, which then engage also users and, and, and industries, you know, in the learning process of, of our students. Uh, I think that sound probably meant I've used my time, but I would just say one more thing, and it's entrepreneurship, you know. So that's another thing that, you know, uh, uh, if you look at, you know, the competitiveness of companies, oftentimes, you know, there are disruptions that, that, that uh, change the way of working or, or demands for big corporations and renewal in big corporations, actually including universities, is not that fast. And then uh, entrepreneurship, you know, outside the company can be a way to help uh, uh, do these, these uh, transformations, you know, so, and, and in our case, you know, what we have found out in this short history of this, this new format is that our students are really uh, powerful entrepreneurs, you know, they have a huge capacity, much more than, than, than uh, my generation of people. I think we should really, in engineering education, we should, we should begin to give a lot more responsibility to our students because, after all, they are the ones who are going to build our future. Thank you, Tula. I was actually just keeping time for my own reference. I didn't realize it had a beepy okay. thing on it, so that wasn't okay. intended for you. I apologize, but <laughs> no that problem. seemed to work, so if anybody hears a beep, just pass it on. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for, the, for discussing. So what we're really getting a, a, some different pictures now of innovation mm -hmm. in, uh, in engineering and in the learning, of, uh, in, in learning, and Salman Khan is a real pioneer of that type of innovation, and there are some remarkable advantages, including accessibility that uh, Sal's uh, uh, Khan Academy has, has brought to the world, and there may be some challenges. So I want to get your sense of, uh, of how we educate engineers. Yeah, I, I'll start just kind of a, how many of y'all are at all familiar with Khan Academy or if he's, oh, oh, very good, we're preaching to the choir. Maybe. I should say well, who's not. Well, as, as, as many of y'all might know, it, it, this all started, uh, you know, my background's in engineering and, and, I, and I somehow ended up in the hedge fund industry uh, a few, few years later. Um, but while, while I was an analyst at a hedge fund in 2004, I had just gotten married and, and uh, one of my cousins was visiting from New Orleans and uh, turned out she wasn't doing so well in math. And so I, I, I offered to tutor her remotely and uh, that, that worked out well. And uh, you fast forward 18 months, word got around in the family that free tutoring was going on. And uh, so by 2006, I was tutoring about 15 uh, kids around the country, most, most of whom were related to me. Uh, uh, after work every day, and, uh, and and actually at that point, and this is what a lot of people don't realize about Khan Academy, I, I didn't even think about the, the whole notion of online video. Uh, backgrounds in computer science, I think anyone who's ever worked in computer science has had these fantasies about writing uh, a software that could help people learn. And, and so while I was doing these, these remote tutorial sessions with my cousins, I said, oh, let me give them, let me write something that can generate practice problems, and if they're stuck on something, it will actually generate the solution, and it will be as many problems as they need. I'll put a database behind it so I can keep track of them and do analytics on it. And I, and I started working on that. And in, in uh, 2006, I was showing, this, showing all of this off to a friend, another engineer, and uh, I said, you know, the, the one problem is, is, you know, no matter how good this software, I can, it was very primitive at that point, um, I, you know, I, I, these tutorials I'm still doing and it's getting hard to scale. I, you know, I used to do very intimate tutorials with Nadia, I could really understand her, but now that, it, and, and I could really dig deep with her, but now that it's 15 students and I have a day job, it's getting difficult. 
And, and, and he uh, recommended, well, you know, there's this thing called YouTube. Uh, why don't you put some of, you know, make some little tutorial videos and, and stick it on YouTube and maybe your cousins might find it useful or they can get some of the stuff out of the way before uh, they have the time with you. And I, I was immediately dismissive. I, I said, you know, YouTube's for, for cats playing piano. It's, it's not for uh, <laughs> serious mathematics. Um, but I, I, that weekend I, I got over the idea that it wasn't my idea and I, um, <laughs> I, I, I gave it a shot. And, uh, you know, famously, but, it, but it's true, I, you know, I asked my cousins after I'd produced 20 or 30 of these, it was early algebra type topics initially, uh, even pre-algebra, and, and they, they somewhat famously told me that they, they like me better on YouTube than in person. And uh, <laughs> I took that as positive feedback and, and, I, and I kept going. And, and a lot of things started to emerge there. I mean, one was, uh, the, to some degree, the timelessness and the scalability of this type of content that, you know, a lot of people on the internet, they always talk about platforms, platform scale, content doesn't. But this type of content fundamentally did scale, especially some of the mathematics that have been around for hundreds of years. Um, and, and it also became clear to me that there was a huge need for this. You know, uh, after a few months, it became clear that people who were not my cousins were, were watching. And, um, and, and, you know, a lot of people were just, high school, college students saying, oh, this really helped, this helped me get an A on my exam. But some people started saying, hey, you know, I, I never got that concept and I was afraid to ask about it in class or, uh, you know, I, I just wasn't engaged that day in class or uh, this is the reason why I was able to re-engage or go back to college after being an adult and not seeing math or, or science for, for 15 years. And so I was excited, I kept going. Uh, 2008, I set it up as a not-for-profit Khan Academy uh, with a, a somewhat uh, modest mission of a free world-class education for anyone anywhere, um, which is, I was sitting in a closet with an IRS form and said, oh, I need a mission. I was like, well, this seems reasonable. Um, and, uh, and then in, in, in 2009, uh, kind of the, 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 the traffic on the site had, had, you know, I couldn't focus on my day job, so I, I quit, hoping that people would realize that there's a very high social return on investment. I think at that point we had uh, several hundreds of thousands of users per month. Uh, then in uh, 2010, uh, you know, it was kind of one of these things that it, was, it, it, it took a while for people to realize that there could be value in a guy operating out of a closet. But, but then once, but then all of a sudden people started to notice, uh, and in particular Google, the Gates Foundation, uh, Ann and John Doerr, a lot, of a lot of other folks in Silicon Valley as well uh, funded us. And we were kind of up and running. I started uh, bringing on some of the smartest people I knew to really build out this thing and, and what the vision is and what was the, the pitch that, w that we made to the Gates Foundation two years ago and, and, and to Google and, and to others was there's an opportunity here to create a, a virtual school and I think we'll have a lot of chance to talk about what a virtual school is and how, and at least in my mind, it complements a physical school, it doesn't replace it. Uh, but if you have nothing else, it's, it's there for you. Um, and in our minds, it's videos, we translate into the world's languages, it's interactivity, it's exercises, it's community so that people can interact with each other, it's rich simulations, it's data analytics to optimize engagement, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we've been working on the last two years. Uh, we, we've, uh, this past month, we reached 7 million uh, students in the last month, and it's been growing at a, at a pretty crazy rate. Uh, we've brought on some other people to make content where we keep pushing the envelope or trying to push the envelope. On, on, on what we can be, and, and the interesting thing that's happened in this whole adventure is, and I didn't, I didn't expect it to happen as fast as it has, uh, right when we, in 2010, when we got our office space, local school district wanted to work with us, said, what would you do with the, this was a, a fifth grade math classroom, and we said, oh, we'll have every student work at their own pace, it would be mastery based, master concepts before moving on, the role of the teacher would not be the lecturer, but look at analytics, look at data, and really do focus interventions, or do projects, or even do engineering at a, at a much younger age. And uh, that's kind of inserted us into this conversation of, uh, you know, how do we rethink what a, what a classroom could be, even what, a, what an education could be, what a credential could be, and I think we'll, we'll probably touch on all of that. And with, with that said, I'll just, uh, I think we have a, a little video that'll give you a snapshot of a lot of what we've been working on, and, and then I'm, I'm, I think later we'll have time to answer questions about any of it. Take a moment and remember your favorite teacher. Now imagine that teacher could reach not 30 kids in a classroom, but millions of students all over the world. That's exactly what Sal Khan is doing on his website, Khan Academy. With digital lessons and simple exercises, he's determined to transform how we learn at every level. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America. So we have seven plums, plus two Chuck Norrises, plus three Chuck Norrises, 
And let's say that I add another two plums. What muscles do I use when I take a free throw? What if there were a fraction that never completely overlapped? For any rational fraction, eventually the star will close. Ciphers allow Alice and Bob to scramble and descramble their messages so that they would appear meaningless if Eve intercepted them. She appears out of control, and part of the reason for that is Hull's handling of brushwork. Right over here you have your coating paint on the left, and then you have a canvas to draw. So it's immediately visual. So this mm -hmm. is something that's pretty basic. Yeah. Uh, the big thing we want to do is we want everyone to be able to see the code and the thing that's running simultaneously. Yeah. You sit here and look at the dashboard. You see how the students are doing individually. You see how they're doing as a whole class. Yep. And you can figure out who you need to help. Exactly. And here I can track their progress over time. I can see who's rushing ahead, who's lagging behind. I can see if they begin to stagnate. He built a platform. If that platform works, that platform could completely change education in America. If I'm confused about a topic, somehow right in user interface, I'd find people who are volunteering, maybe see their reputation, and I could schedule and connect up with those people. Absolutely. And, you know, and this is something that I recommend everyone in this audience to do is, you can, that, those dashboards that teachers have, you can go log in right now and you could get, you can essentially become a coach for your, for your, your kids, your nephews, your cousins, or, or maybe some kids at the Boys and Girls Club. Well, it's amazing. I, I think you've just got a glimpse of the future of education. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Take a moment and remember your favorite teacher. Now imagine that teacher could oh, no, reach no. not 30 kids in a classroom. <laughs> Uh, Sal, that's uh, pretty amazing. A lot of uh, people in the room know what you've been up to, and I, I think you're right. We're going to get a lot of uh, comments and questions and discussion about it. So thank you for, for presenting us with that. Linda Katehi is a chancellor of the University of California, Davis, and she's going to tell us, uh, give us some of her views. Oh, thank you. You know, I was thinking, Ali, there is something in common between religion and engineering. Design. That's right. <laughs> Um, in any case, I, I wanted to say that um, my, my work in the last so many years has been impacted a lot by my very early experiences as an engineering student. Um, when I started in 72 as a freshman back in Greece, there were only two women in a class of 190. And then when I went to UCLA for the graduate program, also, we were very few women in the, in the electrical engineering department as graduate students. And the same experience continued when I became a faculty member at the University of Michigan. We were three female faculty in a, a department of about 95 faculty or so. And so for years, I started asking, uh, of course, I was wondering why is it that there are so few women in engineering? And in fact, especially in the U.S., why is it that there are so few um, students of color who are very interested in pursuing sciences and engineering more specifically? And that is the question that I have tried to answer for many years, and of course, trying to understand it and then trying to make an impact. Um, in, the, in the last few years, the work um, at the uh, National Academy um, that was in fact triggered by the same questions have um, helped me personally and all of us see a lot more into the challenges that engineering education really has faced over so many years and the reasons of why so few of our students from high school select engineering as their own profession. Um, what we have learned, in fact, just to give you some statistics on how unique we've been in terms of this uh, challenge, um, according to the National Academy of Engineering, the statistics that uh, have been provided, 21% of undergraduate degrees in China are in engineering. 11% of those degrees in Europe are in engineering, and only 4% in the U.S. So we do not produce enough engineers. And, of course, for a society that is leading technologically and society that has a citizenry that needs to make decisions, informed decisions about technologies. Uh, it's not just that we do not produce engineers, but we do not produce citizens who are technologically literate or science literate. And that is a big question that we have to address. The uh, projects that we have, uh, the reports that we have um, submitted as part of a multi-year efforts here in the academy asking those questions have indicated that engineering really should not be taught 
um, at the college level, but engineering should be introduced very early in children's uh, learning experiences. In fact, there are programs that are looking at um, how engineering can be introduced in pre-K programs. And what we've learned is that engineering is about the ability to make something that works. Um, as, as Rick said, it's not just a, a collection of, uh, of information that we provide someone, but it's the ability to develop the skills that allow individuals to uh, be observant, to um, identify the problems, to be creative, to think about solutions, and to have the skills to try to make some of these solutions to realize them. Um, we all learn this way, the brain learns this way. I mean, when you look at how kids play, they play using Legos. In fact, they put them together, they make things, they take them apart, and they put them back again. And historically, we felt that that was a distraction to learning. So when kids go to school, we take those Legos away until they come back to engineering, when we give them back to them and we ask them to do things. And so what we've learned is that we should not break that. Um, a, a, a effort to learn. We should, as a matter of fact, um, take advantage of how the brain works and help kids continue to practice their curiosity. And in fact, as they learn more and more about science, then to connect that practice with science. And that is, in fact, what the most recent report about the framework for um, science standards is pointing to that learning science is best achieved through practice. And engineering is practice. It's designing things that can um, improve our quality of life, yeah, things that can solve some of our problems. And there is a new effort, and I'm very hopeful about that, there is a new effort to rethink about science in K-12 but within the context of engineering, within the context of making things. And there are a lot of efforts in many states, and specifically California, where we try to look into those new concepts and develop very specific science standards, both for learning in the classroom and learning after school. And so I think that will allow more students to understand what engineering is all about, it will show more to young kids of why engineering is useful and will get more girls and boys uh, become interested in engineering and therefore continue with their creativity all along. One more um, topic that I would like to touch on and I hope to have a discussion on this is the following. As engineers, we never really care about um, the social impact or very little have we cared about the social impacts of what we create. We identify a problem and we try to find the best possible solution. But I think in a flat world where our technology tools become widely available, it is only very important that for us to become socially aware and feel socially responsible for the solutions we provide. And I think we need to start with that thinking very early. I also believe that social sciences for the 21st century will play a fundamental role in engineering. And we need to think that way as we develop our curricula and as we teach math and science to kids. So with that, I would like to conclude my comments. Linda, thank you very much. Uh, this is all giving us a great deal to talk about, and I want you to start thinking about the questions that you want to ask of our panel. Once we're, we're, uh, we're finished, uh, we're going to have some conversation uh, amongst the panel members, and then we're going to go to your questions. I want to finally take it to uh, Rick Stevens. He's the Senior Vice President for Human Resources and Administration uh, for the Bo Boeing Company. Obviously, it's where the rubber meets the road. You need to find out who all these people are, how they're getting educated, and how you get them to come and work for you. Alex, thanks very much. And Chuck, thanks very much for the uh, opening comments earlier. I've had the opportunity to be involved in a number of businesses. I've been in human resources kind of out of a, a job opened up when I volunteered. I've been doing this job for seven years, so it provides a unique opportunity having run businesses, but also sharing what goes on in terms of making sure we have the talent to meet our needs. What I'd like to do is provide a couple perspectives about the Boeing company, but I think are indicative of aerospace in general 
and I think in, indicative of our technological industries in general. And then I'd like to talk about, the, so what are we looking for and what do we think is important in terms of the educational process? So the what and how do we educate and, uh, and provide some thoughts there. A little bit about the Boeing company, you know, 175,000 employees. We hired 18,000 employees last year. We'll hire 15,000 this year, another 10 to 12,000 next year, the same the year after. Uh, we're the subject and reflect the demographics, I think, in all high-tech industries, uh, set aside the IT industry, where we have the huge baby boomers that are nearing the end of their career and looking to be able to fill our needs. In an environment where unemployment and engineering is about 2.6%, our worry is, will there be enough talent to replace those who are currently providing the leading edge of technology that we need as a nation, not only from an economic manufacturing standpoint, but, but be able to lead us going forward. We have relationships in Boeing with about 150 colleges and universities in the U.S. and around the globe as we look to make sure the talent that they are developing are going to meet our needs. About three years ago, I did something a little bit controversial, I know, among some of you. We took an evaluation and looked at our engineers we had hired over the last 10 years and looked at their performance and promotability and compared that against the schools they came from. We wanted to use that as the base to say, we know what the schools believe where they're producing the best engineers, we want to see if they meet our needs as well. And it was an interesting perspective and we chose very consciously not to share that with anyone other than the deans of the respective School of Engineering as we rank students top 10 percent, next 25, top half, bottom half. It was all about the dialogue about how do we in fact find where the best engineers are and what are the processes to ensure they meet our needs. Let me talk about what our challenges are with industry. Life is ever more complex. Whether you're thinking about a water systems project, whether you're thinking about designing a hospital, whether you're building an airplane, whether you're building a road, whether you're worrying about you know, designing a digital system, it's more than about technology. As Linda pointed out and others have pointed out, it's about how do all those come together in an integrated way as we think about our responsibility to not only the economy, but technology, about our social responsibility and the implications of the environment and how all that plays together. And as, as Ali Ali pointed out in his flight where they sucked a, a few birds in an engine, those are things we have to design for so we make sure those airplanes continue to fly no matter what they run into. So these are all the elements we have to think about more than about just knowledge transfer. So as we think about from that perspective, what are the things that we're looking for in engineers? And, and I would tell you across the Boeing company, and I chair the AIA, the Aerospace Industries Association Workforce Steering Committee. I also chair an organization called the Business Industry Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, Education Coalition that we started uh, and announced the implementation of that here on the stage uh, a couple years ago. We all have the same sorts of things that we're looking for. One, we want technically competent people. And I think everyone, no matter whether it's in engineering or economics or business or communications, we want technically competent people. And our observation is the engineering schools produce technically competent people. We don't see any issues with what goes on in terms of getting people with the right knowledge and insights that, that come out of engineering schools. Number two, we're looking for people that do, in fact, want to continue to pursue knowledge. Critically important that we want people that are always looking to say, how do you continue to pursue knowledge? And I think, as Linda pointed out, it starts at an early age. If you were to talk to Dr. John Tracy, who's the chief engineer and heads up engineering operations and technology for the Boeing Company, John tells the story. When he was young, his dad hung a model of an F-15 from the ceiling, and John visioned he wanted to be able to produce airplanes like the F-15, and that's how he got started. Many of us in aerospace think about Sputnik and what went on there, and I know Dan Golden, former NASA administrators here in the audience, many of us got our start from this vision, this dream, this perspective, always pursue more. But I think the third element is this notion about creativity. And sometimes, particularly the engineering process, is very rote and specific about what we do, and yet the solutions we're looking for are not always predetermined. We live in a non-deterministic world, and for those of you who are computer scientists, and my background's math and computer science, we are very much in a non-deterministic world, but engineering has a tendency to be very deterministic. 
fax things, rid, uh, rivets. You know, we go back and we're about building aluminum airplanes. We want to know where the aluminum comes from so we can manage the process all the way through. But in our world going forward, it's non-deterministic. We need solutions based upon technology to be able to meet our needs going forward. Last, I would tell you, in our business, and I think most in society, society is a team sport. And while we have great technologists developing what goes on from a research basis, we all have to interact together. So the ability to communicate, interact with others, be on a team, share thoughts and ideas, have great discussions and debates, critically important. And I would contend one of the challenges we're beginning to see more and more of is our youngsters grow up in the digital world. They are less and less interested and less and less adept at having real human contact and interaction. I think that's a key challenge we face. I would tell you, and you know, since I'm responsible for human resources, I kind of know the numbers. Rarely do we lose someone in the Boeing company for lack of technical talent. Many times we lose someone in the Boeing company. We have to ask them to go work for the competition for lack of competencies and skills to interact with others. And so when I think about what it means from an engineering education perspective, it is about being engaged and involved in the whole engineering process. Now, there was a New York Times article that came out last November that I took great issue with, and I hope many of you did as well. They talked about why are we not producing enough engineers in America, and the article basically said, because it's just plain hard. I violently disagree. See, when I look and say what we all have gone through from an engineering perspective or development, you know, there are schools today, engineering schools, that are achieving graduation rates that are upwards of 80% from entering freshmen to four or five or six years later, engineers come out the other end. I think that's the model. And there are four things they tend to do. One, you know, what do we all want when we go start something new? We want a role model, we want a mentor, we want something to help us out. So the truly effective engineering schools are getting the right yields. They assign students to cohort of 50 students. So they get the help and the monitor in those first few years, I know, and think back how hard it was in your freshman year, particularly when you moved away from home. And there's also their social opportunities to go play around. Number two, highest dropout rates in engineering school tend to be physics and mathematics. The schools that are very successful somehow get real practical application into what's going on. So they not only learn the concepts and they learn how to apply it. And as a mathematician, differential and Ramanian geometry gets me excited, okay? Most would say, what the hell are you talking about, Rick? Okay, but it's something you know, that I can get my head wrapped around, but most engineers just want to know real practical application. Math and physics bring real practical applications. Some successful schools actually don't allow mathematicians and physicists to teach it. They have engineers teach it. I know some real issues on ABET accreditation, but it's important to make it practical. The third thing that's critically important is you know, when many of us were going to school, we weren't allowed to be involved in projects because we didn't know enough. The schools that are successful get their kids involved from day one in freshman projects because they said, now I can go solve problems. They don't have to be hugely technical issues to go off and work, but it allows them to get engaged in the team sport about partnerships, relationships, working together, thoughts and ideas, because those are the things you know, in engineering. It tends to be in school, it's all closed book tests, we're all open book tests. We're all about how do you pull together in this integrated way. Fourth thing to do, and I believe the academy ought to hold business accountable for this, is the fourth thing that successful engineering schools to get the right yield is make sure their students have internships between at least their sophomore and junior year. And you ought to demand more of us in engineering to help create those because we're the ones that want the real hands-on practical experience. Last year alone, we doubled our intern engineering internships in Boeing, went from 600 to 1,200. We had 1,200 engineering interns this past summer. Next year, we'll do more. That's amongst the total internships of 1,800 across the company. It helps in this relationship of hands-on interactive development activity. The last thing I'll make comment on, I think, is you know, we all need to learn about how better to teach what goes on in the classroom. We can all think back to our freshmen you know, eng or freshman mathematics class calculus or what went on. And I think Saul's got some great examples of what goes on that we can bring into the higher education level. Another gentleman doing some great work out at the university level, many of you know, Carl Wyman, Nobel laureate in physics. He really is up the game in terms of how you get mastery of knowledge at the college level. And for those of you who don't know Carl's work, 
I suggest you go take a look at it because the yield that we will get out of our freshmen who are coming in and the large lecture groups will go up dramatically and get better results. But it is all about making it real, making it a team sport, and, uh, and engaging. And out of that, we will get the higher yields out of schools because schools are doing it today. I'll leave back to you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you to all of you. Uh, you've done an excellent job in a contained amount of time of giving us a narrative uh, that's very different in each case, uh, including some very different approaches to how we, uh, how we deal with engineering education. So here are my non-engineer takeaways from the whole idea. Uh, we like and need engineers. We need more of them. We, uh, we need them to be better prepared and, and changed for a, a, a constantly changing environment. Uh, I guess the question I have is, we've discussed various types of enter, uh, innovation in engineering education. Uh, I don't know that I've fully heard the case for why it's needed and whether, and I'll, I'll ask you all for this, and whether, Rick, you'd benefit from that. So in other words, if you got more engineers trained exactly as they've always been trained, you said they're coming out with the technical skills that are necessary from the schools in the United States. Um, they could do with more creativity. We can have certain courses taught better. The applied courses taught by engineers as opposed to mathematicians. But what do we get for, from a world in which we innovate in the way in which we present engineering in the way uh, uh, Salman's talking about or Tula's talking about or, uh, or Rick Miller's talking about. Are we getting differently trained engineers or are we just getting uh, different ways of teaching that attract more people and that will, will deal with different learning styles? And I'll, I'm going to go that way to ask you to comment on that. In other words, if, if these innovations take place, are you hiring more people or are you making better planes? And by the way, thank you for doing that thing with the wings, with, with the <laughs> engines, that, so that when a bird strike happens, the plane doesn't go down. So uh, my perspective, and having studied this for quite some time, uh, I believe if you go back and look at education history in America, we saw a huge change after World War II. And we went from youngsters, many of us, or many having grown up in the rural or the agrarian society, to now living in many cases in the steel structures of our cities and the metropolitan areas. As a result of that, because of safety issues and all sorts of other issues, we have youngsters who spend less time outside, less time engaged with the real world. They're more digitally capable, but less real world savvy. And uh, there's a fellow by the name of, of uh, oh boy, now I'm a, a blow here in terms of his name, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Glenn, who supported four presidential administrations asking the question, why is it since 1963, every high school class in America on a macro level has had a decline in academic performance. You just have to go look at the data, it's true. And so his hypothesis is, and I, and I believe it, is when we have more and more of our kids growing up in a flat panel world, and I also invite you to go look, I spend a lot of time on the neurological side, go look at iLabs at the University of Washington, and look at the comparison about how children grow up if they live in a real world versus a flat panel digital world, and with all the non-invasive technologies out there today, very striking data that shows real world gets you better. And I'll tell you, I've got six kids. We have six kids, seven grandkids, two more on the way. Our kids are not allowed in the digital world, not because we don't believe digital is important. It's the neurological part of them. The synapses have not closed enough yet. And until that development is complete, you want to maximize potential on the neurological side so you have capacity to use the digital machines and then they're ready to move forward. So I think our kids are just growing up differently than they used to. And uh, if you go back and look at who are the people that put you know, a man on the moon, mostly came off the farm, they could solve problems. So I also invite you to go look at Steve Jobs' autobiography, or his biography, not autobiography, his biography. It's interesting, what did Steve Jobs grow up doing? Taking apart and putting back together cars, not computers, hands-on solving problems. Our kids don't have enough solving problems, and I think Linda's got it on. We give our kids Legos when they start, keep them in the Legos all the way through. They'll do far better off because they're taking apart, putting back many clues. They understand the real world. Then you can apply the academics. They understand then why it works. Thank you. Linda, that was, uh, that was a comment that you made that uh, 
got a lot of response. Mm -hmm. they, they take away the Legos and then you give them back once they're engineers. Tell me a little bit more about your so, view. Um, and, and Rick also mentioned that we all um, talk about this in different ways, but um, I think if I were to go back to your question, say what is going to happen if we teach our engineers differently? Uh, are we going to have better, of, more of them and better? And I would say both. Um, because exactly that, we, we are going to engage them very early in real life problems. Um, they will get more excited about what they will be doing. A lot of kids want to I I change their lives. They want to change the world. That's what most kids tell you. And we need to allow them, I mean, engineering is just about that. But the way we are teaching engineering, have been traditionally teaching engineering, is to give a lot of content. And, and then toward the end, we are trying, even as they grow much older in college, to help them design things. And it should have been the opposite. We need to start with design. We need to start with practice. I mean, get them to experience the, the impact of their solutions, even if they may be incomplete or suboptimal, and get them excited in what they are doing in the process. And that's what is going to get more kids to come to engineering is going to make the engineering workforce more diverse. And I truly believe in diversity because it really fuels creativity in a group. And I do also believe that online experiences are very important as a, a supplemental um, a tool to really provide more. But in reality, we want to take, we want to create people who, are, uh, who know how to ask questions who know how to search together for the solutions, and who can get excited in the process because they do something meaningful. Uh, Anand Agarwal has just uh, dropped in, and we're going to continue through the panel. But when we get to him, I'm going to see the question's going to end up as the same, because you're an IIT guy originally, are you not? A uh, long time ago, long yes. A long time ago. <laughs> and and uh, having just come back from India and talked to, and China, and talked to people who see engineering as a uh, route uh, to success, even if you're not going to be an engineer, but the idea that it's that, uh, Rick, it's what you said, it's that way of thinking, the critical thinking that, that people think is important to do, um, how these new, uh, these new paradigms of learning uh, change that experience. So, so Salman, I'm, I'm conflicted here because you've revolutionized the world, but you really were just trying to help your cousins. Yes. Well, <laughs> right? You were just trying to help them learn something. Uh, and as Linda says, what you were doing was it was supplemental to the studying that they were doing. But now people see you and they think Salman Khan has taken education into the digital world and no one needs a school or a book or a human anymore. True or false? False. <laughs> I, uh, I was going to say something more wishy-washy. Yeah, I'll, 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 the floor is yours. False. I'll say false. And I'll, and I'll actually, I'll start off on, 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 on what the question for the panel was, and, and here kind of speak as an employer as opposed to, I guess, a, a, an educator of some, of some kind. And, and one thing, and, and it's obviously it informs what our own philosophy is. I'll just interrupt is. you for a second so Anna gets the context. Yeah. The issue here is we've talked a lot about innovation in engineering education. What does that do? For people who are employing uh, engineers, we'd like them to be more creative. We need more of them. But why, why, do you, why would you care that someone's getting a more innovative engineering uh, education. Great. And, and so my observation has taken me some time to, to get to this point uh, at, because like I think probably everyone in this room, I was an engineering major, I was very proud of the rigor, I was very proud that you know I could cut it, I could hack it, you know a lot of the peers would be dropping off of these, these filter classes and you felt very proud that yes this is you know only the, the best make it through and all the rest. Uh, but, but as an employer what, what we've noticed is um, we, we get a lot of uh, uh, very smart uh, kids from top engineering schools, straight A's, and, and we say, well, what have you built? And uh, usually, and, and, and actually, it, it's, it's a negative correlate with GPA. Uh, they've, they've built nothing. Uh, they've done some problem sets. They've done some projects where it was very well defined for them, but they've never built anything. And, uh, and, and that's one of our main filters for, for people, if they've ever created anything, if they've ever took the initiative to create anything. And, and I think what we've had happening is, is um, 
this culture of rigor, which I think is great on, on certain dimensions, but, but what it's done is it's squeezed out any, frankly, time for, for creativity. Uh, I, I, you know, I, one of our strongest people, we have a guy who works for us, he's, he's the world's best JavaScript programmer. He wrote jQuery, it's the it's JavaScript pro library used by millions. And you know, when he submitted, I mean, he literally submitted a cover letter, which I thought was a little hilarious, but he, you know, I wrote jQuery. And, um, and we, you know, we chatted with him just to make sure that he had the interpersonal skills and that he wasn't arrogant and all of that. Great guy, really, and, and hired him on the spot. And uh, the whole team loved him. And, and it was two months later, I, you know, I was just having lunch with John, and I said, well, where did you go to college? And he went to Rochester, and, it, and I said, well, what was your GPA? And he said, oh, I think it was a 1.9. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 I, I was blown away because we would never have interviewed someone with a 1.9 GPA, and 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 I was like, well, you know, you're you're like the smartest guy I know. How do you, he's like, well, I was working on jQuery the entire time, and so so you have this, you know, by the time he was 20, he had written a JavaScript library that was used by six million people. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, another. Um, one of our, our best exercise developers, actually y'all on that, on that video, y'all might have seen that little, it was a curve and you had to adjust the slope of the tangent line at any point to really get an intuition of what a derivative is, which frankly most students don't leave calculus with. And uh, he actually volunteered and we saw the work that he was doing, this very intuitive way of understanding mathematics and science and statistics, hired him on the spot just based on the work that he had done. And then we later found out he was a college dropout from University of Maryland. He just couldn't get engaged. He liked to create things. He didn't like to sit and, and, and take tests. And so uh, I think there's a lot to be said. I, I don't want to throw the rigor out. I think that's important too. But, but leaving room for creativity, and I think that also uh, kind of goes to the question of how do you get more people interested, is stressing the creativity in engineering. I think everyone is fascinated by it. Everyone wants to create. Um, and, and you know, on the internship side, I'll also push there. You know, some of our, our, our the best work that we have being done right now in organization is done by some 17 year olds, 18 year olds, uh, young interns. Uh, one university that I've been very impressed with, and I didn't know a lot about it before I was before I was on the hiring side of things, is the uh, University of Waterloo in Canada, which, uh, as, as if I understand, two thirds of their experience is internships. And these students, uh, it's incredible. You know, if you go to Silicon Valley, actually right now, not in the summer. A disproportionate, actually all of the interns in Silicon Valley right now come from the University of Waterloo because the other ones are sitting, all the other students are sitting in lecture halls taking notes. They're writing, you know, uh, they're, they're doing deep uh, uh, engineering work and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking with a, with a computer science lens. So uh, I think there's a lot that can be pushed in, in, in that direction. And, you know, in terms of our role, to, to answer Ali's question about, uh, you know, I, I think what we, what we can do as a as a tool, and that's what we we view ourselves as, you know. And, and it, what's supplemental, what's not, is um, if if we can do if if something like Khan Academy can do, or, and there's others, edX, an uh, leading right now. If if through tools like this, we can uh, get a lot of the the core knowledge out of the way and make sure it's achieved at a rigorous level. And and this is another thing we can talk about, moving to more of a competency-based model as opposed to a kind of a a seat time-based model. Um, I, I think it liberates what can happen when the human beings gather. So instead of it being a lecture, instead of it being taking notes and just listening, it can be much more project-based. It can be much more open-ended, uh, where, where there's, there's room for creativity. And I actually don't think, and, and I think the other, and this was alluded to earlier, it, 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 this whole engineering that only gets reintroduced, you know, it kind of gets initially introduced in a, you know, in a Montessori school and four or five years old, and then it, it disappears and it gets reintroduced when you're probably your second half of your engineering study, really, as opposed to the first half. And it should be something that's, that's, that's throughout. Actually, there's a book coming out tomorrow, The One World Schoolhouse. I wrote it. Um, <laughs> that, that, that is, uh, they told me I could do that. Uh, uh, that but but that, that's, that's the whole notion, that, that we have to, that the, the virtual tools I, I think can, they, they can actually do what a lot of traditional classrooms do today. So if you think of learning as a spectrum of, you know, here's your multiplication tables and here is uh, uh, inventing something new or starting a business or writing a novel, uh, you know, open-ended creativity. Traditional classrooms right now are focused on this end of the spectrum where, you know, okay, can you, can you take a Fourier transform? Can you do this or that? And what we're saying, you know, a lot of, I, I think, tools are starting to exist that can start to tackle this quite well and even assess quite well. And it's not to replace what used to go on here, but now it allows the physical environment to, to, move, to move up this, move up the value chain and, and focus on more creativity. So I'd like to see a reality where when we get applicants, uh, 
that they, there's a competency base. It's not just did you sit in a class for so many hours, et cetera, et cetera. It's what do you know academically, and also what are your portfolio of works that you can show me. And, and, and then that makes it clear that engineering is just as creative as being an architect or a designer because it's all about portfolio of creative works. So thanks very much. Um, Tula, you and, and Rick had something similar in uh, your presentations, discussing multidisciplinary approaches, uh, uh, connectivity with other other types of faculties and areas of study. I wasn't sure uh, from both of you yet about the implication of it. In fact, Rick, when you talked about the uh, no departments, I was sort of trying to figure that out myself, but as you know, I not very good with the system. So um, uh, I'm going to ask you both to just uh, answer the question, but also uh, with your own experience, starting with you, Tula. I would like to reflect first on, on uh, you know, this, this um, how early should you start the engineering education business, you know, because I actually agree very much with, with Linda that, that we, we are starting it far too late. And I think one of the, one of the reasons why I'm saying it is that I, th I think that the kids are actually at an early age, you know, in those formative years, you know, I mean, they, they haven't got a clue what an engineer is or a, or a scientist. I mean, they, see, they still see firemen and policemen and doctors and lawyers. And I mean, they see more lawyers than engineers, you know, in the TV. And, and I think that, you know, it's, it's very, so we've been actually, we had, we've been talking about, I think entrepreneurship is something that is much more, is better taken care of in America. It is, it's a kind of an inherent cultural, thing, you know, to be, that entrepreneurship is a good thing. This is not the case in the Northern Europe, you know, so I mean, ownership is considered, you know, somehow suspicious and things like that, you know, so we have to really work through kind of trying to uh, teach the kids entrepreneurship. So we're thinking of having a, a an alt venture preschool and, and, and for the reason that, you know, we would start early enough to sort of leave a mark into the minds of these people that, you know, this is an option and, and, and that they will remember it. And we had one uh, uh, event already where we had preschool kids at the university because because there's some in, uh, some some uh, uh, research saying that kids that have been in a university uh, at an early age are much more likely to become academic academic uh, or, or adopt an academic education than kids that haven't been to a university and and one of the kids actually we were asking them if they knew what a university is and and one of them said that oh university is a place where you can become what you want to be. And I can't think of a better uh, definition of a university. But if I go, go to this creativity and multidisciplinary um, education, you know, I think, I think uh, uh, what um, Richard was saying about, about team sport, I think, is, is, is essential, actually, you know, because we, we think, you know, we, we didn't ad abandon disciplines or, or departments actually at Aalto University because we think that you know if you want to have a good multidisciplinary collaboration it's best done between experts and, and therefore you know we still need the depth I mean we, we can never give up the depth of, 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 of engineering or, or science you know as a basis for, for innovation and, and, and what we do is, is, is really I mean we, we have really good uh, collaboration we've had funding systems in Finland you know to, to catalyze good interaction between the industries and we do a lot of internships and things like that and, and, and I mean we have you know 95% of our students you know get the job right away you know when they graduate so that's not, a, that, that's not an issue but when you want to have kind of like a, a, a change in the way that they work you know then what we are doing is that we're having creating kind of platforms uh, where, where teams with different uh, competencies uh, uh, work together and they're supervised by, by academic teachers and industrial people at the same time. So we're not, we're not uh, sending them alone to the industries, but we are sort of making sure that, you know, and basically what we say, say in these kind of projects, so the ideas always come from industry, it's very typically a diploma work or a thesis work or something like that for the students. And then, and then we ask the industries for once, you know, not money, but, but engagement, you know. So we ask one of their researchers or product developers to come and work with the team for, for six months. And, and this was also really um, rewarding for the people who came to our projects, you know. So one of the engineers who had been 
working 20 years in industry, he said this has been the most exciting experience of his life because he's able to share with the students the experiences that he has had in the industrial life, you know, for 20 years. You know, not, not just one student, you know, but, but the whole cohort of students that are actually uh, working, uh, try to solve some, some practical problems. So I think that when we talk about this broad education, I think it's really important, you know, you, you mentioned technically competent people. I think that, you know, it's the same thing with design and business that in, in, in this kind of basic broader education, you have to give the people the literacy in those fields that, that, that you need, but then you have to go deep in your own disciplines. But as long as you have the literacy of the, of the other disciplines that you need, then you are able to work uh, as a part of a, a multidisciplinary team that is then, that is then going to solve, solve problems. Thank you. Uh, uh, Anand, we're working toward you. We're so, it's all a setup, basically, for you in a minute. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to uh, Rick Miller and what he said when he kicked it off. Uh, two things that are very interesting, which again are very directly related to this question about why we need this innovation, uh, whether it's necessary and whether it's going to create better engineers. And you described engineering as, um, or engineers as being someone uh, who envisions, uh, envisions what has never been done and does what is needed to get it done, and felt that, that engineering is a process and a way of thinking, uh, not a body of knowledge, uh, and, and that you at Olin didn't create departments. Tell, tell us how this all fits in. Okay, first of all, about the, uh, the case for change, I think there's a very good case for the change in education that the National Academy put together a few years ago in a monograph called Educating the Engineer of 2020. Uh, they outlined, I think, almost all of the themes that you've heard on this panel today about entrepreneurial thinking, about and working together in teams, about uh, taking initiative and about creating things with, that are real, that work. Um, there's been a drop in the number of people that graduate. I think we all know the statistics. If you look at this, uh, you look forward to, in those days, 2020 seemed a long ways away. Today, it's not so far. Um, what will characterize problems in the 21st century is complexity. Uh, the problems are no longer contained in one continent. They, don't, they transcend time zones, they transcend political boundaries, they transcend disciplines. They're no longer technology problems, they're societal problems. And yet the way we train people today in education works against that. When you graduate from high school and you go off to college, you pick a major. If you major in engineering, you spend four years in the engineering quad. You meet only other engineers primarily, and you get a lingo, and you develop a certain sense of arrogance about those social scientists. Don't they didn't have as high a test scores? They must not be able to solve calculus. So, um, and yet, it's those conversations that are essential to solving societal problems. So, what can we do to fix it? As I said earlier, I think one of the key issues is: Are we attracting the right people into engineering to begin with? You've heard a lot about creativity and the importance of that. I don't think you find creativity by looking at SAT scores or even math scores in high school. Uh, you need evidence of creativity for admission, and we've been working very hard in our school to try to bring people into the engineering profession who, who wouldn't ordinarily go. Uh, a lot of those kids that apply to our program don't apply to any other engineering school in the country. Uh, but the way we are thinking about engineering is attracting, by the way, 50% of them are women. And I think if you look at what you know about neuroscience, the uh, right brain um, business is more prominent in women, and they tend to do better in the interviews, uh, in, working in teams. So if you start with the right raw material, you have a head start on the problem. Another interesting thing is that if you look into creativity, and there's some very interesting work being done now in neuroscience about creativity. Um, one of the, oh, in fact, I've got the book in my briefcase. I haven't finished it yet. Uh, Jonah Lehrer, uh, who's a neuroscientist, um, who wrote a book first called How We Decide, which is very interesting. And this latest book is called Imagine How Creativity Works. There's some controversy about the book, but the, but the material in there I think is quite good. Uh, he points out that getting people to bump in to folks in a different environment that was not planned, that was not in the discipline that you came up with, is fundamental to getting creative results. He mentions, for example, Bell Labs and how they were organized. He mentions 3M Corporation. He mentions Google. He mentions Steve Jobs' decision to reorganize the architecture of Pixar so that the bathrooms were located in the center of this atrium 
everybody in the company had to go to the bathrooms at some point and run into folks who were quite different as a deliberate strategy to improving creativity. Hey, Pixar has a better record of producing uh, Academy Award winners than any of the other um, companies that make movies in Hollywood. Uh, so there, there are strategies that you can do. In our case, not having departments was a very deliberate strategy. And in fact, we, we hope that our students are not able to tell us what they're learning. We don't want them to tell us, I'm learning physics or I'm learning calculus now. Uh, we want them to be engaged in solving real problems from the day they arrive so that, for example, by the time they finish, they have done 10 such projects that have issues that are relevant to them so that they really care about the outcome. Um, a, a interesting way of thinking about this uh, certainly occurred to us. Engineering, in a way, is a performing art. And I think we've learned more about engineering pedagogy from art schools than we have from science schools. Uh, so if you think about that, suppose you had a child who really wanted to be a violinist and they went off to a uh, conservatory of music. Um, if, if that conservatory of music had an, an educational program that was patterned after the way we teach engineers today in most engineering schools, what would happen? In the first year, the student would take a course in the theory of sound, okay? We talk about vibrations, we do physics problems, we figure out how strings vibrate, what mode shapes are and frequencies. In the second year, we might take a course in the theory of composition, okay? Harmonics and melodies and so on. If you're really patient, in the fourth year, they might allow you to touch the violin and actually play some scales, <laughs> okay? I don't know a kid who's a prodigy in violin who would wait until the fourth year to do that. We have to change the way we teach engineering so that the process is in the center of what we do and all of the applied science is scaffolded around it in order to help you achieve higher results. Well said. You have all uh, really answered the question very differently and, uh, and, and really presented up with some, some, uh, the case for change, as you say, Rick. So thank you for that. Um, Anand uh, joins us from MIT. Like uh, Chuck Vest's experience with Salman Khan, you've had a similar one. He was some he was in a class or he had something to do with you you've, you've you're sort of responsible for him for president best bit. mentioned that he didn't remember me but you did i, I uh, yeah absolutely you knew that you were you already remember. Okay. um i want to i want to ask you uh, you don't need to answer that question necessarily but you, you can uh but i want you to tell us about your thoughts about engineering education and uh I, i'm supposed to ask you what a mooc is mooc what's that <laughs> <laughs> so MOOC is uh, a MOOC is a four-letter word. Um, it's uh, it's massive open online courses, and it it, it reflects this big movement in learning uh, over the past uh, six months or a year, uh, where a number of us, uh, there's uh, edX, Coursera, Udacity, are offering these uh, uh, courses online, free to students around the world. And uh, they're online, of course. Uh, this is, I think, for the first time, a real concerted attempt at applying computing technology to, uh, to learning. Uh, you know, I like to say that this is the first uh, biggest set of innovations in learning since the printing press. Uh, so MOOC is this, this movement where, uh, in this year, as we disrupt learning by applying technology to uh, learning in a, uh, in a really big way. Uh, let, me, uh, you know, let me try to talk a little bit about how innovation and learning uh, relates to uh, relate to MOOC. So, uh, uh, briefly, a quick introduction. Um, edX is a uh, so I'm the president of edX, and edX is a nonprofit venture of uh, Harvard and MIT. Uh, Berkeley has also joined the group, and a number of other universities are also uh, going to be announced uh, soon. Um, edX is offering online courses to students worldwide. In our first course that we offered in spring of this year. Um, with zero marketing dollars, we had uh, 155,000 students worldwide uh, take the course. And the you know, truth in advertising, we advertise it as a hard course. In fact, we advertise it as a MIT hard course. And we said second order differential equations and complex analysis are prerequisites to keep people away. And 155,000 students signed up the ex uh, for the course. 7,200 students passed this really hard course. And you know, that's as many students as uh, would take the class at MIT in 40 years. So we taught, so we taught the course with the same staff. And some of these statistics are absolutely staggering. Uh, we taught that class with about the same level of staffing 
as we would teach a one semester course at MIT, which about 100 to 200 students take, same staffing. And so we taught as many students as would graduate from that course in 40 years at, uh, at MIT. So it, so it was pretty staggering, bringing technology to, uh, to learning and applying it in a concerted manner. Uh, you know, this will truly uh, revolutionize, uh, truly revolutionize the world. The platform has a number of, you know, how do we, how do we teach? How is this going to revolutionize learning? And the first thing that we do is uh, you first take all the things that you know and you replace them all uh, because uh, you know, a lot of these things are pretty antiquated. In large lecture halls, you know, if you look back a uh, 100 years, you know, we have lecture hall photos from uh, MIT and other places, and uh, you see it all in black and white. You see chalkboards, and you see professors with chalk dust on their coats and, and handwriting. So today you see the same classrooms. Uh, there's two differences. One is the seats are in color. whoop de doo <laughs> And the second, we have sliding blackboards. <laughs> the biggest innovation, if, if the biggest innovation at one of the top 10 or 20 universities in the country or the world, you know, MIT, can be sliding blackboards, what does that say about us as technologists and engineers and, and creative people? It is, you know, when you, when you think about it in those terms, it is absolutely uh, stunningly shocking. So the first thing that we do is we replace the large lectures where, where you know, uh, attendance is waning. You know, even, even with pretty good lecturers, it's not unusual to see 20, 30 percent of the students showing up in the final parts of the term. So what we do is we, we replace the lectures with the new things called uh, KS, KSVs. Does anybody here know what a KSV is? One guy knows it here because he invented it. So KSV is a Khan style video. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> it's very flattering, thank you. So, uh, so I can take some credit. Uh, he was, you know, Sal was in my, in my class, and I may have talked about it or something, but I don't, <laughs> just kidding. So, um, so, so KSVs, uh, these are these uh, video snippets, you know, five to 15 minutes long that uh, talk about a concept and really reflect the way our modern day students, uh, you know, think and, and engage. And I know my son, who's a teenager, um, uh, I don't think they think in more than two or three minute chunks. You know, if, if you don't engage them in two or three minutes, you know, they're off doing one of 16 other, other things. And you need to give things in bite-sized chunks. And a number of studies have demonstrated that it's a good idea. So what we do is, on the edX platform, we've replaced lectures with a new concept. We call it sequences. Okay, we call them learning sequences. What's a learning sequence? And so our platform and the UI reflects this new uh, pedagogy. A learning sequence is a sequence of video snippets, a sequence of KSVs interleaved with interactive exercises. Okay, so every five or 10 minutes, you know, you make the students do something. So in a large lecture hall, we try to do that, you know, particularly when I teach. And every three or four minutes, you know, I, I say, hey, uh, so what do you think? What's a KSV? Okay, and, uh, and uh, you know, usually, you know, uh, there's one person sitting in the front or, or, you know, nobody knows the answer. A couple of people raise their hands. But fundamentally, not everybody engages. And not every lecturer uses the style, you know, where you ask a question. So how many people, uh, people here use that style in their own teaching? How many people ask questions? How, how many people pepper the lectures with, uh, with questions here? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. You know, uh, uh, you are the leaders of our, of our nation and the world, and you know, uh, it's, it's not surprising you do that. That's what engages the students. So what we do with online learning is we interleave exercises with these videos. And by doing that, after watching a five-minute video, the student has to answer a simple question. All right? So I think what, uh, what Sal invented uh, was these video snippets. Where edX is taking it is turning a lot of these core technologies and ideas into a full-fledged learning experience where at the end of the day they get a complete course. And towards the end, we even give them a certificate and a credential. They take an MIT course, a certificate from MIT X. They take a Harvard course from Harvard X, Berkeley, Berkeley X, or from any other. If you talk to a number of universities, it would be University X where the certificate would say that so-and-so has successfully passed the course. Uh, we've also announced a major partnership with Pearson where students can take proctored exams throughout the world, which will really allow the student to demonstrate their own, own work. So interleaved exercises with videos replace a lecture. These are called interactive sequences. And if you go to edX.org and, and, and take one of the courses happening right now from Berkeley, Harvard, MIT, you'll see a UI that reflects this new concept, this, these learning sequences. Now, you know, a number of people have commented that if, if all the world is going to become is these video snippets with these exercises and some of them multiple choice, 
And by the way, the first course from edX in the spring had no multiple choice. Okay, so uh, so uh, but a number of the for profits focused on multiple choice. If if all you replace the world with is videos with multiple choice, you know I think it's uh, no worse than sliding blackboards. It's the online equivalent of sliding blackboards. I think the real challenge, and you know this is how it relates to creativity, is you know teaching creatively and 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 having the students learn creativity. It's about you know if, if learning is about, you know, one part of learning is about analysis, you know, you, you, you study what is, but creativity is about what will be. How do you create something? So, uh, so we've challenged ourselves in terms of how do you teach creativity? How do you bring, bring that into the, into the fold? You know, Olin College does some spectacular work uh, in that area. In fact, uh, we've uh, just hired Mark Chang, uh, a star from Olin College, to you know, help us create some of these things at edX. So one idea, and this was in our first course, is an online laboratory. So here what we do is instead of starting with a circuit or starting with a video where you sit back and you watch with eyes glaze over, but luckily it's only five minutes and then you get an exercise, but still, yeah, you know, it's passive watching and maybe you do some exercise and analysis. Here what you do is we give the students a blank sheet of paper, a virtual paper. You, on the screen, it's a laboratory. They get a piece of, uh, uh, you know, for electrical engineers, it's uh, a, a virtual breadboard. For everybody else, it's a piece of graph paper. On the right-hand side of the graph paper are a bunch of components. For the electrical engineers, it is uh, MOSFETs and resistors and so on. Um, in, in, in civil engineering, it would be, you know, uh, members and uh, you know strusses and you know uh, beams and things like that. And the idea is you get a bunch of components on the right-hand side, and students can, from an empty sheet of paper, we tell them go design something, so they can drag those pieces of components, rotate them, and with Lego-like ease in a gaming in sort of gamifying learning-like method, build these things. And then they can say, in the laboratory, what would you do? You know, you would take a $20,000 scope and connect it and see what happens. So here, if you do the same thing, on the top part of the screen, you get a bunch of tools, oscilloscopes, analyzers. You know, in the mechanical world, it would be things like, you know, tell me what the strain in this member is, you know, or simulate the bridge. You click and you watch a bridge collapse, you know. Uh, we're working with, uh, with physics and electromagnetics in physics. You take an inclined plane and watch your balls roll down. You know, does a ball roll down faster than a square you know, block? So do these what-ifs kinds of experiments, and, and we've done that. And, uh, and students can analyze and see what uh, things look like. In fact, we also introduce music into it uh, where people can pick you know, uh, what music to apply to these models and see what music sounds like as it gets processed through these systems. And students are loving it. One student commented on our website in the discussion forum, that uh, you know, I had no clue how to do this, but I sure enjoyed the reggae music. <laughs> so, so, so people are building these things, and there's a really funny story that I have to tell. So what he said is, this gives you creativity. But the second important part about creative learning and design is community. And how do you get small groups of people to design? So it's really creativity and community. I think the two C's coming together, that's the key, I think. So how do we get that together? So we said, hey, let's put this graph paper on our wiki. So on our wiki, you can put the graph paper and design uh, in groups. And, and uh, I haven't done that yet, but one thing I want to do this fall is give them a really hard problem and tell the students around the world, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 or whatever, say, hey, look, go, go see if you can collaborate and build me this. It will be chaos, but let's see what happens. So there's an interesting story. So we put this on the website, and this one student was painstakingly designing something, and he must have gone for uh, you know, a, a coffee or, or a fluid of his choice. And when he came back, you know, he, he, he wrote to us on a discussion forum, say, hey, you guys have a bug in your, in your system. They said, my design's changed, you know, uh, but things have moved around, you know, this is, there's a bug here. So we responded back, uh, silly you, you know, this is collaborative. Somebody else in the world, probably from Pakistan, is modifying your design, and the student was from Tunisia. So, so people around the world are modifying each other's stuff, and, and, and they didn't even know that they were collaborating with others. They just saw the design change underneath them. So this is such a whole, uh, such a new concept. So there are a number of things like this that uh, edX is trying to do in creating a new learning experience where we are trying to be, you know, bring, bring creativity into it, bring the community into it, to really take online learning to the next level so we can improve learning, you know, not just in scale. So really, a lot of the MOOCs, MOOC, MOOC movement has been about massive. It's been about open. It's been about online. So it's been about massive, which is scale, and free, open, and all that stuff. But what we are trying to do is trying to bring the creativity and the community into it in a big way as well. Thank you, Anand. Excellent. I appreciate that. Shula, you wanted to? 
was just to mention about this, you know, learning environments, you know, we see also that they are, of course, changing and the lecture halls, you know, we're building a new campus as well, you know, and we're not planning a single new lecture hall because we don't think that this type of environment is needed. But I think that this human contact uh, angle is, is quite uh, interesting. And the thing is really to engage the students in a way that is, is memorable for them, you know, I mean, so for some, somehow, like you say, learning experience, you know, one of the experiences we had in Alto is that uh, when we started Alta University, you know, it was the first or the second summer, you know, the students came to me and they said, well, look, you know, we've got this great idea because there's this Shanghai World Ex Exhibition in China. So we thought of uh, renting a train through uh, Russia and we'll take 100 students to China, you know, by train. Can we do it? <laughs> And I was kind of like, hmm, <laughs> can they do it? <laughs> uh, fortunately, I said yes, you know, because, because uh, that ended up in, a, in an actual uh, really memorable learning experience for them. Because uh, first of all, I said that, yes, you need to, you can do it, but you have to have a few professors with you, which is not always that easy to get professors for a week to Siberia. Uh, <laughs> however, <laughs> they, they did a lot of good marketing and, and talking over the professors, so they managed to do it. You know, and then they had these TED seminars on the track. They even had exams on the train, um, and then they visited places that no one's, none of them had ever been before, like Ulaanbaatar Library and things like that. They visited Finnish uh, production sites of electronic industries in China and things like that. You know, so I mean, uh, talking about problem solving, you know, it was a great experience. You know, as a learning experience, it was great. And, and on the other hand, you know, I, I had no problem to market Alta University, you know, in Shanghai because we have been really concerned about, you know, about our brand because we're new. Because we had 100 students with Alta t-shirts all over the world. Everybody knew about the, the, the students that came by train. So I think we need to be quite flexible also for the student initiatives, you know, how they want to learn and, and what would be interesting for them. And I think that they learned a couple of lessons that would have been really difficult to, to explain to them um, in a lecture hall. It, very interesting. Uh, you know, there are there are real differences that you're all bringing forward in, in the idea of um, how you might adapt to better learning from students. It's a good, it's a hot discussion, and my producer always tells me I always look for a, a, an opportune time to take a commercial break, and he says never look for the opportune time, end it while it's hot, and come back at the other side. So I'm going to have to do that because I wouldn't, I don't really want to give you a break, but the, the program says I have to, um, <laughs> and I don't want to lose that momentum. So if you could. Uh, take a break and try your level best to be here uh, in 15 minutes so we can open this up to you. Think of your questions. There are two mics. Uh, we've got people with mics on either side of the room. When you settle in, I will find you and give you questions. Yes, that's right. That was very good, very good. Dig, drinking your coffee and your snacks and going to the restroom. But if I can get everybody in as uh, quickly as possible, I want to get started and have uh, a great, robust discussion with our panelists. Let's start in about uh, 60 seconds, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's, yeah, it's cra really crazy on TV. I mean, they were two times. Really yeah. so I lost my oldest, but I actually got another function that we can like, meet potential for the audience. There's this big gap that's TV, which is yeah. really our current education yeah. for adults. That's right. It's 30 yeah. seconds. You can never yeah. do that. Oh. I mean, your textbook is very yeah. intense. Yeah. Colleagues, uh, Lindstein. People need 10 minutes, 20 minutes to understand yeah. the yeah. classroom space on there for TV. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to have you stand at the mics. I'm going to uh, have. We've got two gentlemen with mics. You identify where you are, and uh, and we'll come out to you. Uh, so so don't worry about standing uh, there. I will. Uh, okay. I see a lot of hands going up. I will try my best to keep track. Wow. Okay. That's why I want everybody seated because I want to get through as many of these as possible. Okay. Um, two things. One is. Uh, uh, I, I think it was, I'm trying to think now, everybody had such great things to say, but I think it might have been Anand who was talking about uh, solving problems and, and Rick talking about people solving problems and internships and all that. I don't know what discipline this falls into, but if we could as an afternoon, oh, Anand was talking about keeping people engaged after every few minutes. I think there's a great exercise we can have here after a few minutes if somebody can go redesign the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so they can, I mean, there's got to be 2,000 seats in this place. and. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I lost, maybe there's a bathroom I didn't see. 
Um, anyway, that's my little contribution. Okay, here's the, here are the ground rules. The ground rules are that there are none. Uh, you can ask what you want. Uh, however, could you just put up your hand if you're an academic? Yeah, you guys are really bad for Q&A, <laughs> generally speaking. It starts with a lecture, and it's a this, and it's a that. I'm not, I don't object to you making a point. It doesn't, if you, if you don't feel that it needs to be phrased as a question, this isn't Jeopardy. But uh, if you could just try and take the first six minutes of your question and just say it silently to yourself, <laughs> and then just ask the last 30 seconds. That'd be great. <laughs> Okay, enough from me. Uh, I want to start with one question of my own that doesn't have to do with bathrooms, and then I'm kicking it out to you guys. Can I, the two gentlemen with mics, just show yourselves? Thank you. Um, and we are going to start on this side with that gentleman there, because I know he was standing at the mic, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on all of you over here. And on that side, gentleman in a red tie, about six rows in. There. Yeah. Right there. Okay. But, but hold on to your questions first. Sit down for a second, because I'm going to ask the first one. Um, that's part of the gig. Uh, I have the, uh, we have a narrative that uh, we have in the, in, in the news, uh, we, we get from talking to people, uh, and for various reasons, that there aren't enough engineers in America, that America is not graduating enough engineers, we are importing a lot, we are bringing people in to study engineering, we have some visa issues, uh, the narrative goes that we, we don't train enough, we bring people in and we don't really give them the visas and they go back and basically we're training other people's engineers. Uh, I don't really know that that's true. I don't know that it's not true, but it's, it's what we hear a lot of. So I just want to get a quick, because uh, I want to get through lots. So I don't want to make too long, but I want to get a quick response from our panel. Let's start with you, Rick Stevens. Yeah, I don't think we're creating enough. Uh, if we look at the demographics across industry, we have too many people going to retire. We don't see a pipeline large enough to be able to fill that need. Anybody differ or agree strongly? Well, I agree strongly, and in fact, I was going to say, in addition to not having enough engineers, we do not have enough diversity in there. We do not have enough women, and we do not have enough um, students of color who go to engineering. Why would it matter, other than it being good for Because society? it brings different perspectives to the table and allow the, allows the teams to be more creative. Do I need a different perspective on an airplane engine or a bridge or a mining operation? Oh, you, dif you need different perspectives on all of those. Do you, you need different perspectives in cars, in everything we use. I mean, women are the 50% of the powering, uh, of the uh, buying power. <laughs> or power. <laughs> See, my general view is that I've heard that if women uh, were, you know, there were more women in politics, we'd have fewer wars. So why don't we just let women do politics? And then, you know. We should have done that too. We should have done that too. <laughs> Agreement, disagreement anywhere along the line? Uh, uh, just a quick, uh, just a quick point. Uh, uh, so Farnam Jahanian and his team at uh, the National Science Foundation as part of SICE did the study. And there's a really compelling chart that they produced showing uh, in various disciplines uh, the number of openings and, you know, uh, you know, skills and jobs that are unfilled, the number of graduates. And, uh, uh, and, if, and it looks across the board, and you find that for engineering, uh, the, there's more jobs than, uh, than people who graduate, and it's none worse than computer science, where it's a disaster. We have a huge number of unfilled openings, and we graduate very, very few. So that's a very compelling chart that Farnham's put together. And uh, I'll add one thing. You know, uh, all of this actually, you know, it was a big question for me 10 years ago, is that there's, there's been this shortage of computer science engineering, but you've had this kind of, uh, the, the economics didn't seem to point in that direction. You know, obviously, to become an engineer, you need at least as much hard work and intelligence as to become a doctor, lawyer, hedge fund analyst, whatever else. Uh, but the economics weren't there. But the, the one good thing that I am starting to see, and unfortunately, I'm on now on the buying end of, of, of the engineers, uh, uh, is, is that you are starting to see, a, a ma especially in computer science, a massive ex uh, kind of acceleration in incomes for people com right, coming right out of computer science. And, and, and I, I think there's a lot of structural things we can address, but I think the a good trend is that the, those computer science incomes are now becoming at parity with doctors, lawyers, and, and hedge fund analysts, which, which will hopefully equate things. Linda? So um, the, uh, not having enough engineers is a big issue, but I think our biggest problem is that we do not have a technology literate public. And that's what we have to fix. There are a lot of issues out there that we need to debate as a public, and I don't believe we have the ability to engage in science discussions mm -hmm. and talk about nuclear energy, talk about GMOs, talk about other things, even the Google, and, and how is it uh, constructed and utilized. I mean, 
we don't have the ability as a public to be engaged yeah. meaningfully. That's, that's a lot of the reason, you know, that I, I keep coming back here and I stay engaged um, with the NAE because I'm, I'm trying to see what we can do in the media to, to try and, you know, in, in the world we exist, try and make this more engaging. And, and uh, some of you have spoken to how, to, uh, how you get the right people into it, how you make this, how you portray it properly. So these are, these are important discussions. All right, enough for me. Sir, to you. And please identify yourself. Uh, and, and by the way, if you've got electronic equipment on you, it's causing a little interference in the mic, so put it to, uh, you know, airplane mode or whatever. Howie Rosen from Section 2. I have uh, twins that are nine, year old, nine, nine years old, fourth grade, a boy and a girl. What should I be doing to get them and their classmates to want to be engineers? <laughs> I'll, oh, did you want to start? You want to take a start? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't know the exact answer. I have a three-and-a-half-year-old and a, a one-year-old, uh, so I, I, I'm a little bit behind you in that. But I, I ask myself those same questions, and I've thought about, hey, should we create our own school of the future, and what should it be to really get people engaged? And, and, and there's a couple of obvious things. I mean, we got an idea earlier today, you know, don't take away the Legos, uh, which, and I don't know if you all have seen some of these new Lego kits with the Mindstorms. I mean, you could do a PhD thesis with these things. I mean, they have heat sensors and touch sensors and light sensors, and I've seen, and memory, and, memory and, and, and I've seen nine-year-olds do fantastic, creative, really deep things with these things. So I would say definitely do that type of thing. Um, and, and, you know, one thing that I, I have told my wife, uh, because I have family members who are, you know, 25, 30, 40 years old, and they're still kind of drifting in their career. Um, I was like, both Dean and Imran, my one-year-old and three-year-old, by the age of 10, will learn how to program a computer. And, uh, and, and so I, I think, uh, I, 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 and the way to introduce it to them is really just a creative, fun thing. You know, we, we have some stuff on Khan Academy now that's designed for nine-year-olds to, you saw that little smiley face when the video, but you should you, try it out with them. Actually, uh, the president of our organization, his four-year-old started working on it, and he re immediately got the Cartesian coordinates and immediately started figuring out. I mean, it's, it's amazing what these kids can do if you approach the same content in, in, a, in form of play as opposed to kind of a didactic mathematics type of thing. Yeah, my, my, my sense, and with, with seven grandkids and two more on the way, it's get them outside, get them to go play, go interact. They'll get the computer skills when the time is right. It's about real hands-on experience, and let me do a little survey in the room. How many of you grew up playing outside? Okay. How many of you thought you were going to kill yourself doing something dumb when you're playing outside? <laughs> Those are real-world experiences, so critical to understanding about the real world, and then the academics fills in to go with it. And I think in our society today, we've too much containerized kids, particularly from an early age. And the more you get experiences, the better the academic academic item plays into. So kids, how many of you grew up with the rector sets, Lincoln Logs, Legos, and all that? I mean, those are the things that you get. And when you got that, then they're ready to go on a practical application. The kids are getting better and better. In my mind, it's about experiences. It's about you know playing. It's about involving. Those are where you build the social skills. And, uh, so um, um, I'm not going to respond directly to your question, but I will tell you what we've learned from an academy, from an academy report and effort, um, especially when it comes to girls and, and how they choose engineering. And they said, most of them, that their choice is based on the input they received from their mothers. So it is very critical to make sure that um, our girls who will become mothers in the future, that they have enough understanding and appreciation of science and engineering so they can teach it to their children. Because kids, uh, before they go to school, they spend most of their time with their mothers at home or with other caregivers, obviously, but that's where they come into contact with others and they ask questions. And you need to encourage that. You need to encourage them asking questions and giving them an opportunity to find an answer that is going to grow their curiosity and make them more interested in participating in these other activities. Rick? One of the things that uh, is a problem today is that the world is so much more complex and so much uh, flatter than it used to be that uh, kids can easily get the feeling that there's no hope of them making a big change in the world. It's just too big. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the, they have a, a, tr a, a challenge to get over thinking that they cannot make a difference. And you can do something about this. Be careful about the messages that you send. It's not about getting the right answer. Um, it's about 
envisioning things that you can do, mm -hmm. even on a small scale. Mm -hmm. so, so to build the can-do attitude, mm -hmm. um, I think, for example, if you had them do three projects in a row, uh, that they identified things that they thought was a problem, that they, they could see one of their classmates was struggling getting on and off the bus or something, and they took on, a, and it doesn't have to do with science or technology, mm -hmm. and they had a vision for how they could work with others to make change. And if they succeed at that, it will exceed their expectations. And if they do that three times in a row, they begin to have a can-do attitude. And I think that's an important ingredient to getting young people involved. Excellent, excellent variety of answers. We're gonna go to the gentleman in the red tie, and then we're gonna go to the uh, woman in the yellow jacket. Notice I'm picking people based on the color of their clothing, so you have a better <laughs> chance of getting picked if you put something bright on. Uh, Philip, sir. I'm Frank Barnes, and my question is, is there, how, how do you have approached using some of the techniques you talked about, the 95% of our students that don't go into engineering, and how do you get some of the engineering content across to getting them to understand some of the things we can and can't do, and things like risk analysis, feedback, so on. Who'd like that? Linda. <laughs> well, one thing that we do um, on our campus, and, uh, and I know many other campuses are trying that, is to get students from all across the various disciplines and bring them together in various groups and have them work together. For example, you want to create something, you want to design something specific, you get students from the humanities, from us, from dance maybe. Um, you get students from the business school, you get engineers together. And it's not so much that you're going to teach them one more class on how to do a design, but it's by practicing with their colleagues where they learn on how to approach solving a problem. I, I would like to go back to design because I think this is a fundamental skill for good quality life, um, is learning on how to um, start with a problem that you haven't come up with a solution. And, and design is not just an engineering skill. It's a skill for everyone. As a matter of fact, if you go, I, I was thinking, I was thinking this morning that uh, we, are, we have a very narrow definition of engineering even because uh, designing clothes is just another en engineering um, activity if you think how many parameters you have to put together and how you have to optimize your product, I think it is exactly um, what we do in engineering. It's just that in um, design, they do it in a different way. Architecture is the same. I mean, there are so many things and so many activities where you can bring students together and have them practice it and learn from those interactions rather than traditional teaching in the classroom. Yeah, I'd like to actually also talk about design because the, the thing is that, you know, I think if, if you think of the kids, which we were talking about before, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, and I don't know, I'm trying to think at the same time as I'm talking, you know, but this sort of concept of childhood, I think we have somehow sort of misunderstood it, you know, that it needs to be something that the childhood needs to entail components which adults don't do. And I think this is a bit of a mistake. I think, I think you should engage your children to your life, you know, and that's maybe because there are so many caretakers that we don't do that as much as we used to do before. And so I'm not sure that it's only our friends that were teaching us, but I think it was also our, our um, parents that were teaching us practical skills and problem solving in the everyday life at, at home. But, but when you think about the design, design kind of um, concept, you know, I mean, it's actually interesting that you took the fashion industry as an example, because we have had, a, of course, you know, in a, in a university where you put together artists and, and, and engineers, you know, and, and even business people, you know, there's a lot of kind of uh, fighting over who's important and who's, whose qualities are the important ones. And the fashion designers were the ones that were at the lower level of the, of the understanding. And, and we actually, you know, they, they, they are very good, you know, and you should see it as, a, as an engineering challenge and a, and a business opportunity in a country. And so in order to emphasize that we actually had a fashion show in our opening of the term, just to lift it up, you know, as a, as a serious business. 
and 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 um, yeah. So 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 when 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 you do these kind of things, you know, co-creation. I mean, we were talking about how things are difficult, and of course they're difficult if you see no meaning in them. You know, so you have to do some algebra or something like that, and you don't need it. But if you are a fashion designer and you see that there's a material scientist that is working with something interesting for you, then obviously uh, it becomes interesting and less difficult because you have a motivation to learn about it. And that's why I think that these co-creation platforms and, and teamwork is, is very important for, for crossing these kind of bridges. Yeah, um, let me just respond by saying kids are naturally interested in big problems. Mm. Uh, the kids today that we run into are attracted to these grand challenges. They really care about sustainability, they care about health, they care about security. Uh, they're a bit intimidated by them, but if you can get them engaged, it really makes a difference. And let me tell you a couple of small stories that help cut across these disciplines and, and position engineering in the center of society so that it's not something that's off to the side and only takes math and science. Uh, a couple of years ago, a friend of ours, uh, Paul Romer, who is a, an economist at Stanford, some of you might know him, has been interested in developmental economics, and he had this idea called charter cities. Has anybody heard of charter cities? A few hands. Basically, what it's about is he looked at um, Hong Kong and noticed that it was left over after the Silk Wars, and the British kind of ignored it, but uh, treated it with common law, and that was it. And the Chinese came in and became entrepreneurial, and now it's this giant force for economic development. China is now blueprinting what's happening there in terms of the rules and trying to spread it within the country. Uh, so he said, wow, what if we did that on purpose? What if we decided to create charter cities in the developing world, go and talk to uh, leaders of different countries and ask them to lease us 20 square miles of land on a seaport for 100 years? And then we'll bring in Western uh, business leaders and see what happens. And then we'll give it back. Um, and he got so excited about this that he told me that he actually resigned his position at Stanford and he's now going around the world talking to leaders about this. Uh, he called me back an hour, an hour later and he said, you know the thing that keeps me up at night is somebody might say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll have to design a city. Um, he said, that's a big problem. Do you think your kids might be interested in this? Uh, so we went to our neighboring schools, which are Wellesley College, which has no engineering program, but it's a liberal arts school, and Babson College, which is this business and entrepreneurship school, and we put together an interdisciplinary team of about 30 kids who spent a month developing a blueprint for a city. It turns out that this has all kinds of problems in it. It has transportation, it has uh, you know, sustainable energy and so forth, but it also has social justice, it has banking, it has international relations, and they had to learn to talk to each other. Um, I've also been teaching a course with the presidents of Babson and Wellesley called Issues in Leadership and Ethics. And the main purpose of this course is to get students from the three different colleges to encounter each other with difficult problems. They routinely come to us and say, it doesn't really matter what you guys say. Uh, what, the most important thing is learning what the students in these other fields are thinking. Um, and this has actually changed the way they think about their career and their ability to interact and to work on big problems outside of their disciplines. What a great idea. What a, what a very interesting idea. Rick Stevens. Uh, bringing a couple things together, and the point you raise is many view that it's just plain hard or they don't get it or understand it, I think was the point. And one of the things, if you look at the amount of time our children spend with the media, our kids, it's up about 10 to 12 hours a day. You can look at all the studies and you can say there's some good media because there's opportunities to learn, the others just plain impact with media. The facts are that about 10% of all mainstream characters in the media are related to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. About 70% of those create ill will. They create the problems and therefore we're creating the wrong image about what an engineer or scientist in what, could do. In what way? Do you mean like, like mad scientists? Oh, the, it's or the mad evil. scientist. It's the diabolical plot. Right. And the problem is solved by a kid who gets bit by a spider, Spider-Man. And so these are the images that tend to get created as opposed to creating content that will help our kids see it the right way. Uh, we're actually working with the entertainment industry because they have the exact same issue. The entertainment industry is so digital now, they need scientists and engineers to be able to create their future world to be successful, they've grabbed onto this and says, we gotta help solve this problem as well. Goes back to, are there enough engineers to be able to meet the need? 
And, and so there's actually awards now, the Academy Awards, so to speak, called the SET Awards. It's done every November. Our second one's coming up. But it's a way to develop, go work this. The reason I raise it, all of us have the opportunity to talk about the positive ways in which engineering impacts. There are great after-school programs, back to the question I asked earlier, whether it's FIRST Robotics, you know, what Rick just talked about, whether it's Project Lead the Way. These programs are going all the way down to the elementary level, where we're getting mentors at each level pulling kids along. The more we can help support programs like that, the better off we'll be. And whether an engineer goes into aerospace or to banking, frankly, I don't really care. We want more technically competent people in our society because the point's been raised. We have some tough, tough issues, whether it's environmental, whether it's about pollution, whether it's about cities. All these elements require a better understanding of technology, and we don't have to go too far beyond, you know, Dave Leno, man on the street, to give us real pause for concern about do our people really understand science technology if we can't get past the basic elements of what goes on in politics. Thank you, Rick. All right, we're going to go over here. I just want to see some hands on this side of the room, and I want to go over to the back there in the front row of the second half there. Keep your hand up, ma'am. There you go. Thanks, Randy. Okay. Go ahead. My question is about uh, the interdisciplinary education and uh, practice. Uh, as we all know, interdisciplinary education has been a subject of uh, interest. My specific question is about the engineering school course curriculum offering. Uh, the traditional disciplines such as chemical, uh, civil engineering, and uh, the uh, materials in the computer science, electrical, versus the inter so-called interdisciplinary courses. So if you were, if you position yourself as the dean of the uh, engineering school uh, or the provost of university, you know, how would you want to uh, see uh, the curriculum going to be and going forward to better uh, prepare the students for the future world. Univers uh, do you like to see, uh, as we all know that the course is offering, so it's not uh, infinite. So there's only a number of the courses. So what do you like to see to design the curriculum which would better uh, prepare the students for the future? Anand, let's start with you. So I think the first thing I would say is that, uh, you know, our university structures, uh, shockingly, are extraordinarily stovepiped. You know, we have these things called departments. Now, I have no, uh, no quibble against departments, but the problem is the departments are in narrow disciplines. You know, there's a civil department, there's a Mechie department, there's a computer science department. And, and what happens is that you have students coming in and you have departments creating schedules for courses and, and so on, and, and each of these schedules are created just by viewing the needs of that department and the faculty of that department. And so our modern student coming in uh, really wants to change the world in a different way. They're very interdisciplinary. They want to have a much more of an uh, you know, international experience, much more of a multidisciplinary experience. But our departments are very stovepipe. I'll give you, tell you a little story. Um, you know, as we taught the worldwide uh, MOOC class with 155,000 students, we also taught a blended on-campus class with uh, 20 students where the students did both in-person interaction in addition to the online um, materials. And so we asked some of our students, look, you know, we want you to come into class twice a week at 11 a.m. in the morning so you can interact with us. And two or three students said, we can't do that. So we said, why not? They said, well, we are from, uh, this was an electrical engineering class. Well, they said we are in mechanical engineering. And over the past few decades, the basic Mechie class 201 or whatever, you know, was in the same time schedule as a 6002 from EE. And there are lots of students from Mechie that want to take the class who never could. This is the first time, because you've taken away the shackles of the scheduling in, stovepipe, uh, in a stovepipe manner, you're now able to do it. So my sense is that even simple things like you know, uh, uh, you know, taking away the structures that bind some of our stovepipe departments together can just make it easier for students to get a multidisciplinary experience. So that would be the first step. And then we need to find ways to give out degrees that are not ME degrees or CS degrees, maybe find a way to give engineering degrees or, or things of that sort, because this is where the world is moving to. Rick Miller. One of the things that's very <coughs> fascinating about the field of engineering is that we have been very careful in creating our textbooks to make them about scientific principles and about theorems and about problems, and we've removed all the people. 
very little of this has to do with people anymore. I know I was an undergraduate in aeronautics. One of the things that I ran into along the way was a Reynolds number and a Mach number. Now these, these are actually, they didn't just come from God on a tablet somewhere. There's a story behind there. I mean, Mach was a person. Um, how come I didn't hear about him? Uh, it turns out that what you know about uh, the way people learn also says that they learn most from stories and mostly from stories about people. So there is an enormous opportunity to improve the interdisciplinarity and the contextual understanding by increasing the engagement with people in what we teach. One of the, one of the approaches that we've taken at our school, which could be done elsewhere too, we have a course that's called the Stuff of History. Now the Stuff of History is a combination of the history of science and the principles of material science. And it's taught by two faculty members, a historian and a um, material scientist. And they do this through the lens of, in this case, uh, Paul Revere. Now, it turns out Paul Revere, in addition to other things that he might know him for, was a metallurgist. And he also was um, an entrepreneur. So you begin to learn the history and the development of the principles of material science with real experiments that were conducted, in this case, in the Boston area by a, a real historical figure. People will remember that. Uh, the students will have it in context. Jula? Yeah, I think, you know, the one thing that um, one should maybe not forget, you know, in this sort of midst of multidisciplinary education is that, you know, and, and is, that, is that at some point of the career of an engineer, you have to give them the deep understanding of something, you know, because, because I mean, they are building bridges and aircrafts and things like that, you know, so, so we should not kind of deviate from this science-based curriculum for, for, for engineers too much, you know, but I think that, you know, what we are trying to do at Alto is that, you know, we, we broaden quite a lot, you know, the undergraduate education at the bachelor level, you know, it really to give them this kind of literacy of these, these other disciplines as well. And then even at the, at the bachelor, after the bachelor, you know, going to the, to the graduate education, you know, we try to give the uh, students choices uh, of different kinds of study paths, you know, so not not to let them to to avoid the difficult subjects, you know, but 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 to give them uh, a possibility of kind of building their own future, and I think that's really important because, uh, as 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 we discussed before, you know, it's we don't really know, you know, those if you look at the. There was a video by Sony some, some time ago, you know, where they were looking at uh, education and they said that, you know, they'd done some analysis looking at, you know, that the 10 most popular jobs today didn't exist 10 years ago. And so it's kind of like this kind of a reality that our students are also facing. That we, we, and and uh, we, as educators as well, that we don't know what the professions and, and, and jobs are that we are educating them for. And that's why I think that, you know, sometimes the students have a better uh, a vision or, or idea of what the future might be, and that's why I think we should let them engineer a little bit their curriculum themselves as well. So that's kind of how we are trying to, to, to manage it, you know, and then, and then you know, have, have, have them the deep knowledge, but then make them interaction, interact with people with other type of deep knowledge, you know, and then, and then all in all, all you have sort of a bunch of really intelligent people in the room with the uh, joint problem. And, and that will train them in, in, in um, the multidisciplinary way of working. But they do need some basic skills in the other ways of thinking as well, I think. Thank you. We're going to go up there. I'm looking for somebody up in that top quadrant. Right there, second gentleman, first row in on that section. Okay. My, my question follows pretty much along this discussion, but gets a little more specific. If we talk about getting more exposure of engineers at, at the, or kids to engineering at the high school level or engineering students at the undergraduate level to social sciences, there's got to be some changes that are part of a two-way relationship. Um, I've been involved in helping high school teachers incorporate into their uh, curriculum how to read and write technically as opposed to Shakespeare. Not that Shakespeare's not valuable, but it's nice to know how to write a technical paper or to read one. So, and I think you mentioned that as was going on at Olin by joint team teaching. There, are, I think if this is going to work and we are going to bring up engineers that are, understand the world better and other people better, there's got to be some changes in the social sciences to meet us halfway. And I wondered if anybody on the panel had thought about what those kind of changes needed to be. 
My, my co-anchor, Christine Romans, who uh, I have a degree in religion, she has a degree in English literature, uh, but her father's an engineer, comes from a family of engineers, loves engineering as much as I do, um, did a survey of, of the, uh, some of the degrees that you can get in social sciences and the arts and found that um, the best paid, if you really want to study English, the best paid English writers end up being technical writers right now. It's interesting. The, the market may take care of that problem. I'll, <laughs> so. I, I'll throw out something that I always thought was a, was a huge gap. I mean, when, when you're in an English class right now, you pr predominantly study Victorian literature is kind of the, the core of it, which is great. And, and actually, I think that's another question. You know, we were talking about getting women into engineering, but that's a, a lot of reason why yeah, I actually did like Pride and Prejudice, but it's a, 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 a big reason why a lot of boys aren't as interested in, in, in literature is because it's, it's, I guess, not as interested in that period. And, and, and the, 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 the one type of literature that's completely absent or almost completely absent from especially the K through 12 is science fiction. And, and science fiction, at least for me, it continues to be the inspiration for you know, 90 percent of, of what I think about, and especially the whole genre of hard science fiction, which is really just extrapolation of what can what is what can be done today and what has not been disproven what, what hasn't been disproven can't be done and anyone who's ever read a hard science fiction novel all of the ideas of physics and science and engineering and material science come into direct conflict or support or play with the social sciences and they're incredibly uh, stimulating things things to read and and I actually think there's there's a lot that, that can be done there and 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 it's a, a whole other thing of just so much of literature right now is so backward looking. There's nothing wrong with that, but this is also tends to be much more forward looking. And it just needs a rebranding. I mean, some people now call it speculative fiction because it isn't just about dragons and unicorns. It is about extrapolating science today to what, what it can be. Very interesting. Thank you. Rick. This is not exactly what you asked, but I think this whole problem of being able to communicate is central to being successful as an engineer. And it's been a challenge for generations. I think I remember reading in ABET uh, for 20 years, the number one concern about improvements in education was to make engineering uh, graduates better at communicating, and yet we don't seem to make any difference. Uh, one of the things that I think might help, again, returning to this image that I presented earlier about thinking of engineering as a performing art, if you thought of engineering as, say, um, an analogy with a music school, what do you see in every music school at the end of every semester? A recital, right? Um, and that's not because the beginning students are going to play you know, Mendelssohn, but on the other hand, they're gonna play something and they're gonna build their confidence and their ability to be more successful in their can-do attitude. Engineering students can do the same thing. At the end of every semester, if they had an opportunity to stand and deliver in front of the entire community, both in oral and in written and in posters that would be uh, equivalent to what you'd see in a professional um, society meeting, uh, you could make quite an impact in terms of motivating people and engage them, and you also help the social scientists to figure out what engineers are doing. If you, if you can introduce one more analogy, I'm going to put you on my TV show. <laughs> okay. Linda first and then Tula. Yeah. Um... We have made those observations about what we have not been able to deliver in the classroom for many years now. It has been almost um, 12 years since we started talking about the engineer of 2020. And we came to the same observations and realizations. But I, I would like to suggest that um, the problem is fundamental. The reason that we have not seen change in our curricula even if we have been making those res, uh, observations is because uh, of the way we have developed the model of the university. And let me just speak about the, the university right now. Um, our universities consider the faculty as the core. And in reality, um, I would like to suggest that the students are at the core. If we were to make that fundamental change in the way we think about the university, so it's a student-centric rather than faculty-centric, and if we were to develop the curricula with the student at the center and not the faculty member, then we would come with totally different decisions. At this point, the reason we have all of these courses in our curricula and have remained the same since I was an undergrad is because we have a group of faculty who are expected to deliver courses in their own areas of expertise. And we tend to produce faculty who look 
and act like us. Our students, graduate students, are going through that kind of an education. So we have departments which have not changed their the intellectual demographic for the last 50 years. And therefore, as a result, the curricula have remained the same. If we put the student at the center, and if we start looking at everything through that lens, then our decisions will be totally different. Thank you. Did, uh, Julie, do you want to? I'm sorry, just, one second. Just, I, just a short comment, you know, on this, this, um, uh, these kind of exhibitions that you can have. You know, we actually do have, and it's a good example of how this kind of multidisciplinary approach in a university can actually stimulate even in the ways of working. And also, they, in the design school, they had this, what they called the Masters of Art exhibition, you know, which was the graduate thesis work, you know, of the, of the master students that they were ex exhibiting. And now with Alto, we have turned it into masters of Alto. And what happens there is that, you know, they actually, both the engineers and the designers, and we haven't really gotten the business people exhibiting yet, you know, but we're working on that. Uh, but what they do is that, you know, they, they actually, you know, sort of show, and, and if it's a fashion designer, they are showing the clothes, you know, and if it's an engineer, they are showing the parts that they made for the, for the paper factory, for instance, which is quite interesting to see. They get ideas from each other, but uh, not the least, you know, they, they get to meet potential future employees, employers, you know, so it kind of turns not only as an exhibition of their, their work, but it also m turns into a kind of a job fair at the same time. My name is Andres Weintraub. I'm from Chile, South America, and I'd like your advice. In Chile, engineering is a six-year career. Maybe as a consequence, engineers have more prestige and make more money than doctors and lawyers. There is a big discussion now. Many people want to go the American system, have a four-year career for engineers, with a fraction going to a master's or PhD. And the discussion is, can you form a top engineer in just four years? I, I actually think you can form one in, in, in less. I mean, I think there are, uh, you know, we, we have uh, an 18-year-old who's working for us right now who's as good as any of the graduates from the top universities, uh, and, we, and we're seeing many of them, and it's, and it's really because at a young age, he got exposure to a lot of this project, a lot of this can-do attitude that a lot of the, the top graduates haven't. So I don't think it's a matter of seat time. I, I think it's a matter of, of competency and having a portfolio of works. So actually, if anything, I, I would, you know, part of the conversation on how to get more engineers, I might actually accelerate it the other way. And the good thing is, I agree, I mean, in other countries, engineers are kind of the, the top of the totem pole in terms of economics. Um, I, I think the good thing is in the U.S. that that's starting to happen as well. Uh, Randy, where are you? I, I want to, I need, I, every time I need, I need this gentleman in the middle because I need one person who's got the same haircut as me. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman right here, all right, well, here, whichever one of you can get it to him first, it's an engineering problem. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I thought you would. Before you ask anything else, uh, it is this gentleman here, the fourth row on the right, right, you sir, with the red tie. This gentleman right here. Wait, there you go. Okay, good. It's not, I don't have a thing for red ties. It just happens to be you happen to be wearing a lot of red ties today. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Yeah, I thought that you were ignoring me because I didn't wear a red tie, but thank you. Uh, 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 I have, I'm kind of disease from Stanford, and I have been teaching for almost 50 years in Canada and the U.S., and some of the discussion we are having is very good, but it's not so different as to what we have been talking for a long, long time as to what is an engineer and how do we teach those engineers. The thing that I am most excited about, really excited about, is MOOC. I want you guys to imagine how we produce an engineer and what the engineer would be 20 years from now using the technologies that are here now and will evolve in the future. That's really what I'm most excited about. Hey, you, you guys are just really good at answering and asking questions. I must say, I like that. Uh, we are, uh, I'm gonna, did, did anybody want to respond to that? Uh, you, you, yeah, I'll, I'll, you. Let's you start here first. and then we'll go to you. Yeah, I, I think one of the important questions that you raise is, and, and Sal just raised it, how do we in industry know that we've got good engineers? And I tell you, one of the things I'm walking away with is, do we go more for ABET certifications for a class based upon a MOOC or something like that? But somehow I gotta make a decision, 
what's a good engineer or a bad engineer when we're trying to hire 4,000 engineers? So we need some basis for determining quality. We can look at portfolio. We can look at internships. We can go work that side. But I think the engineering system has to figure out how will you certify an engineer because I got airplanes today, 14,000 and flying, that are certified by someone who, who can go to the FAA and say, that's a good airplane to go fly. Somehow, we need certifications out, whether it's construction and buildings and all the other elements that go along with it. I think that's the other half of the equation. Uh, yeah, and to just follow up, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the problem that, that we're seeing as an employer, and obviously infor it, it, it informs what we become as an organization, are the, the signals we are getting from these, you know, Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts is not an incredibly strong signal. It's just kind of an initial filter on resumes, and then we come in and then we essentially do a, an assessment with them, an oral assessment, which we call interviews, which we tell them to do something at the whiteboard, and, and there's a social component to it as well. I, I think the, and there's also another dimension that, you know, in, in many engineering programs, you go very, very deep in many, many, many things, while most of what you're doing is not going to be a lot of that. And so I think w there will be a move, and I think the MOOCs are that direction, I think some of, where it's going to be a competency-based uh, situation. And, and <clears throat> what, what I personally find, and this is, you know, to answer your question about what's new going on, th this is exciting because I think it addresses more than just, as an employer, how do you get a good signal that someone actually knows something. You don't care, you know, a 4.0 GPA, they had to take a lot of different courses, who knows what they did. If you didn't go to that university, you don't know how rigorous it was, et cetera, et cetera. This would be standard. You say, hey, you know, I really care about someone who can do these skills, and some of them it might be very academic, very intellectual, or it could be soft skills. And, and then on top of that, it gives a, an opportunity for people who are outside of the traditional system, or maybe they, when they went through undergrad, they were an architecture major, or they were a fashion, who knows what they did, but later they discover they have a love for, for engineering, a love for design, like, like Ali, it wouldn't be too late for you um, <laughs> to, uh, to rehab. <laughs> and, 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 and learn through MOOCs or, or Khan Academy or whatever they, they did or on the job and then prove that they're just as good as the MIT grad or the Stanford grad and get re-engaged into that. And so I actually think it could also address some of the, the structural unemployment issues where in engineering you have a 2% unemployment and you can't get enough people and in the rest of you know, recent college grads there's, I've heard, what, 40, 50% unemployment. It's, it's crazy. This gentleman, uh, Randy, in the sixth, floor, sixth row, red, there you go. Red I, look, I don't know what's with the red tie and the blue shirt. But. I brought this red tie uh, with, uh, with you bought the it knowledge four minutes of the ago benefit that would accrue to me. Uh, Alfred Spector from Google. So two questions. Uh, first, I want to think that perhaps this continuing education uh, aspect, which you just touched on, is perhaps among the most important. question came up, is four years enough for an engineering degree? Is six years? None of them are really enough through the course of a lifetime, I think, today. So I hope the panel can address that. We found at Google we gave a course out even on using search. And of course, the usual 150,000 people signed up, which is what seemed to sign up for all courses. That's an easier course, however, so more people finished than finished electrical engineering at MIT. Uh, search is somewhat easier to use. Um, second question uh, is, it seems to me that the standard infrastructure for doing the simple MOOCs that people have today is fairly simple to build, right? YouTube and simplified uh, problem sets. We put out uh, an infrastructure for it quite easily to help people do it as an open source platform. The hard thing's going to be the really creative platforms and non touched on for really sophisticated learning. And I wanted to address this to Richard first on this one. Um, I've always thought of the 747 flight simulator as the most wonderful educational thing we can think of. Presumably no pilot would ever get on a 747 for the first time without having flown the flight simulator. Based on that and what it must cost to build that, what's it going to cost to produce the educational curriculum on this technical infrastructure that we have that's as good as the 747 flight simulator across all of mankind's pursuits. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> let, 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 me, let me just comment. I, I, I would agree on the continuing ed. We, we have 22,000 Boeing employees going to school right now. We spent $100 million sending our employees back to school. We believe in it that much. Last year as a company, we spent three quarters of a billion dollars during training education. We have uh, just 3.2 3, uh, 3 million hours of internal education and training within Boeing beyond the university. So we fundamentally believe it's important and the products and services require it. The points you raise about simulators, really important. Yeah, we're not gonna let anyone fly any of our airplanes without having gone through the simulator. It's an important part about building the technical competencies and skills 
and then being able to go on to say, okay, now we got it in the real world. There is this real pull, and for us, the measure is whole loss rate. Now, whole loss rate, what's that? Number of airplane crashes. We want it to be zero, and that is, in fact, our focus, or none of us will get on a Boeing airplane or any other airplane. I think that's the question we have to get to is, what's the real measure that will determine whether or not our uh, education is sufficient or not to be able to meet our needs? And that's part of the discussion we're having right now. What really makes a good engineer? Because when it gets to carbon composites and our flight control, we want people who are really deep. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we want people who be able to apply that in a system perspective. So I don't know the answer to your second question. Hopefully the first one helps them. I, I think that's part of the debate we need to go through. Uh, so, uh, so last week on your, on your first question on uh, continuing education, uh, I was giving a speech at Rafael Reif's inauguration at uh, MIT as part of the uh, event. And uh, you know, after I talked about edX and some of the experiences, uh, there was an uh, uh, alum uh, from MIT who, uh, who uh, made the following suggestion, which I thought was brilliant. And it's been bouncing around in my head for this past week. So here was his idea. The idea was we have a four-year degree program, or five years or six years and so on. We bring people together in this, in this place, and we you know, cram them up with a bunch of stuff, and then we let them loose. Um, but, uh, there are a bunch of issues with that. There's quality issues, there's uh, you know, uh, issues with efficiency and cost and so on. So his idea, uh, I have his name, was brilliant in my mind, was that why don't you bring in students into universities for pick your time duration? Okay. I think one year is sufficient, maybe two years. So they get the campus experience. Okay. And it's your chance to proselytize them with some stuff and point them in the right direction, hopefully. Okay, and then after one or two years, we let them loose. And they go into the world, and using you know, MOOC-style learning and so on, you get them to do uh, on-the-job learning. You know, let's say you're doing something with uh, uh, you know, construction and so on. You really want to learn about energy. You go take an energy course. So learn by doing. You know, the Olin model, but really continuing learning. I'm really intrigued by it, and, and it's, I just can't get that out of my mind. Uh, somehow I think that uh, I think there's something there. To your second point, which is, you know, um, what does it take to build a flight simulator? And, uh, you know, how can we do this for all disciplines? Well, uh, let me give you a couple of data points. I think there's two things that will solve it. First of all, for a lot of technologies, you, you actually don't need to build a flight simulator. For the uh, circuit simulator that uh, is on edX, two of my colleagues, it was Jacob White and uh, Chris Terman, who, you know, who are uh, just, you know, uh, spectacular people, uh, they built the whole simulator in, I would say, the space of about uh, two people months. It was white and term months, but, uh, but it was in two months. And, uh, and they did something average. And here, you know, an 80% solution is good enough where you're teaching people. You know, you're not taking, you're flying with people around. And the second thing is that the edX platform will be open source. And already, because it's open source, we are working with a number of organizations around the world that are contributing software. They're working with Concord, who is contributing chemistry simulations. They're working with MIT, who's contributing electromagnetic simulations. We're working with a number of organizations who are contributing to the open source. And I think, I think the answer is open source. Linda. So, uh, of course, I agree about uh, continuing education. And I like very much the idea of keeping the kids on campus for a limited time, not really so many years, and then allow them to continue learning uh, while they are practicing it. About simulators, of course they are very important, but I would say, I have to say that we should not forget that the pilots who learned on the simulator before they flew 747, they had flown real planes before. And the same thing about our students, you cannot really replace the experience that they need to have with an online system. Those online, of course, are very important, but they are auxiliary tools um, for engineers to really learn. I mean, at the end, they have to build a circuit. There is nothing, I, I don't know how to say that because I, uh, my work was um, theoretical, and then when I started doing more experimental work, you, you can really appreciate how much you learn in a lab when you try to put something together and you fail. There is nothing more important than that moment of failure because you have to go back and relearn it. And it's different than the, the, the experience that you get in a simulator. So 
Well, I like all of these ideas, obviously, because you reach out, you allow people to do this while they are distributed throughout the world as they try to, to receive all these kinds of experiences. At the same time, I think um, real life learning and um, failing, real fail, failures cannot be replaced with anything else. Very good, sir. Uh, Misha Schwartz, Columbia University, uh, Section 7. Uh, two questions on uh, distance learning uh, that we've been hearing a lot about, um, one of which is partially answered, perhaps. Uh, Richard's been talking a great deal, and I agree with him, about the need for communication among engineers. Now, you, when you have your courses taught primarily through the Internet, there's no communication, real communication. Now, we, talk, we heard talk about a virtual laboratory, for example. Even there, the people participating jointly in a laboratory experience are not really talking to one another in a human way. So that's question number one. How do you handle that problem with large-scale distance learning you're talking about? The second question relates to the role of the teacher. Let me give you a little an anecdote. Uh, 25 years ago at Columbia, we had a, an a, uh, engineering research center, from NSF-sponsored engineering research center on telecommunications. We had an industrial advisory board. And one day at a meeting of the Industrial Advisory Board, we had a presentation by a professor of, edu of modern education, multimedia education, specialist in education. And he was proudly talking about his work with students at, at Dalton School, which is an elementary school, elementary high school, about how they'd been working with computers, interacting, uh, learning all kinds of new things. When he finished the question, the engineers there raised to him, engineers, excuse me, professor, but what's the role of the teacher in all of this? So his answer was, well, the teacher's there to mediate. And I've heard that word used here, too. I always thought the role of a teacher, and I'm a teacher, was to inspire students, to get them going. So what's the role of a teacher in this new environment we're talking about? I have a feeling uh, a lot of our panelists are going to want to answer that. Let's start on that side with Anand. Sure. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it turns out the answer, at least in my mind, to both your questions is, uh, is the community and uh, you know, discussion forums. One of the things we, uh, you know, uh, many of us have children. Uh, you look at my uh, teenager. Uh, he began to speak a new language a few years ago. And uh, it's called, uh, how many of you heard of uh, Teenlish? It's a new language called Teenlish. And uh, the language, it's, it's a digital language. It has just two, uh, two sounds. One is silence and one is a grunt. <laughs> and... Uh, in, in, so, in, so, the, so the trick is, how do you communicate with them in this, with this new digital language? And it turned out that we were not communicating. And th then I discovered that the way teens communicate is texting. So now, no matter where he is, you know, if I send him a text message, boom, I get back a response in five seconds. Can't talk, they speak English. Can't, they can't talk on the phone, they don't pick up cell phones. But you text them, they respond. That was the single most important discovery in my, what shall I say, my family life, you know, uh, since I know. And that completely changed the equation. So in today's day and age, people communicate differently. I think, I think it's texting. They're very comfortable typing. You know, I'm just not used to typing questions and, and reading responses. I like to talk to people. But I'm, you know, maybe I'm antediluvian. But I think the modern-day kids are very, very comfortable getting on discussion forums and getting questions answered. So on our edX forums, the amazing thing was that we found, uh, you know, despite the hundreds of thousands of students taking the course, a small staff of uh, seven people could support him simply because uh, people were answering each other's questions and learning as they did so. And you said, who's the teacher in all of this? Short answer, they learn from each other. A number of students uh, pointed out that they were learning by teaching. So a teacher can be involved as another participant in the discussion forum, and most of the time I would go to answer a question, but someone who could type faster than me typed a, uh, you know, a partial answer, and all I could go and uh, say is, good answer. So I think they learn from each other. I think that um, online learning is going to change the game. There's no question about that. It's going to make uh, accessible uh, content and knowledge, which is right now bottlenecked in so many ways. But I don't think it's a, the complete answer. I, to me, I think online education will be a net benefit to the education only to the extent that it results in an increase in the engagement of the students with their material. So if it replaces engagement with the faculty member, you now you just go home and uh, watch the internet, it will not result in an improvement uh, over having one-on-one -on -one discussions with real people. 
the other thing is communication is a very interesting thing. It, 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 there are lots of kinds of communication for lots of different purposes. Mm -hmm. And if your purpose is to persuade people to win an NSF grant, if your purpose is to uh, sell something, to get a client to invest in you, I think it's going to be a long time before we do that with texting. I think you need to be there in person, you need to make eye contact, you need to develop confidence in, in who you are as a person and trust. That's going to always require standing on the stage mm -hmm. and delivering as if you were at Carnegie Hall. Uh, I'm thinking maybe a little bit more like, you know, that the engineer is not just one type of a person or one skill set or something like that. You know, I think even as we people, we, are, we all have different strengths and weaknesses. I think this applies to engineers as well. And, and, and why I'm saying it is I think that, you know, when you, when you look at these, these different ways of teaching that we have these days, you know, I mean, I don't think that the net-based uh, uh, teaching is going to take over. I think it's just going to be like, you know, we have had over the years all kinds of different uh, fashions and, and different kinds of ways of reforming the teaching. And I mean, these, these different ways of teaching they, and, and learning, they, they complement each other, you know. So, I mean, I think the human contact is always going to be, be important. And, and, and I don't think that even in your, your company, you know, the Boeing uh, aeroplanes are built by one engineer, you know, I think they're built by huge teams of people that, you know, have to be, and, and I think that if you look at, you know, the, the quality requirements, you know, what is important, you know, you build an, an aeroplane or, or a bridge or something like that, you do have to have an element of critical thinking, and you have to be able to, you know, question decisions, your own decisions and other people's decisions, and and, and if you ha and you need good communication in a in a team to be able to do it, you know, so that you actually ensure that you know this actually is going to fly or it's not going to break or whatever. So, so I think we I, I I see it more like you know we are going to have a sort of a whole portfolio of ways of learning, and people will kind of be commuting between the different ways of learning. Some people will have more of the of the e-learning because of their situation or their preferences. Other people will have more practice-based learning. And it really is, comes to these communication and team building and, and, and team working skills, you know, that, that you can make a kind of a team that uh, actually, actually gets, uh, uh, gets results. And I think one thing that we haven't really talked about that much, you know, but I know that it's an important part of an engineer's uh, education is the, is the learning uh, on the job, you know, so because one of the things that, you know, at universities, I mean, it will be really a big challenge for us, you know, with all the diversity and all the difficulties to predict what the industries are going to be in the future to kind of tailor make engineers for specific industries. So at, at some level, we're going to have to be a little bit generic, you know, and give engineers that are able to learn these practical skills on the job. And then the question is whether there should be better collaboration between the industries and the universities in the continuing education and, and so forth, you know. But I think, I think learning to learn is really one of the really key things uh, for, for future engineers. So, so the, the, the main themes that we've, we've heard throughout this whole thing have been this, this sense of uh, learning by doing or projects and, and real world experience, the sense of community and collaboration and then getting inspired and mentored by uh, professors or peers or, or whomever. And I think that those are all exactly right. And I think I, you know, I agree with everything that was said so far. Uh, current online technology will not replace that and it, it, will, it, will, it will get better and better. I think there is something, this, what Anant is saying, I mean even you know, things like text and instant messaging, you know, we, we, we tend to be very, uh, we downplay it, it will never be as good as, as a human interaction. And, and I agree, for what human interactions are good at, it will never be good at that, it will never replace it, but there is a whole dimension that is being explored that I, I think is interesting, where you can, be inter, inter, you can be deep on whatever you're doing and write for that little nugget of information you can plug in with the community and then go back instead of having to do a 45 minute meeting or a one hour meeting. So there is, there, there is something interesting there. Uh, but, but I think, I, I think you will always have a human aspect to it, but I think all of the themes here, and, and going back to the original question, if people have been talking about these themes for forever, for 50 years, is uh, they need to be asked of, of the physical experience as well. That right now the bulk of intro science, math, engineering courses, uh, other than at Olin, are lecture-based, 
where 300 people sit in a room, they take notes while someone's in the front of the room, little to no interaction. It's actually, in my opinion, it's dehumanizing to be in a room of a thousand people and never interacting with them, never getting to know their names. The professor doesn't know who you are. Uh, Anant remembers me, but... Um, <laughs> sure. uh, and, and so I, I think the big, if I say there's one takeaway here, yes, there's a lot of stuff, interesting things with online. What, what I think the most powerful thing about online is it's a catalyst for everyone in this room to go back to the campus and say, why are we giving 300 person lectures? Can we eliminate all of them tomorrow? Is there, is there any reason for us to continue with that? And I think that would be a big takeaway and a big game changer for the next five years. If five years from now we say, on no campuses are there lectures at all. It's all interactive, it's all project based, it's all uh, people helping people and being mentored by the professors. Linda. I believe we have collectively responded to the question, and so I was going to just summarize that um, the value of the teacher is very important. Um, it is the one who normalizes the discussions between the students. I don't believe that anyone can learn without a teacher playing a key role, and I, I think social sciences will tell you that there is a human need to be uh, connected um, and to come into contact, to learn from others. Um, it's as if we would believe that we can produce professional football players just by learning from each other without a coach. We would not have any football teams. I mean, you need, the, the, that's the, the role of the teacher, is the role of the coach. Now, um, the online allows, of course, for a number of interactions to be simplified. Of course, it replaces a huge auditorium with a screen, and you don't have to uh, sit in uh, on a seat like that for for an hour, an hour and a half, or three hours, but you, or three hours like this one. <laughs> but you can, you could all take this, uh, I guess, on the web real time. Um, I, I truly believe, however, that we are making a big mistake by thinking that we can replace the human interactions with online. People have not changed over thousands of years, and if we believe that in the history of the human um, kind, this is the time of the biggest technological revolution, I think it's, we are wrong. There have been many times in the human history where we had, in, that, in, in those contexts of those times, we had major revolutions, technological revolutions. The human need remained the same, and it's not going to go away. And I believe the teacher has a key role to play in the educational growth, in the educational experience of an individual. I'll, I'll talk more from a business perspective because ultimately we end up with the results of what goes on online in the real world and what I'll call two experiments within Boeing. One was we had a concept about design anywhere, build anywhere, and we eventually pushed to go virtual because of the IT technologies got so good we could connect anywhere in the world and we had teams everywhere. One of the things we learned though at the same time was because we could do that, we also said, A, our project engineers are leading from a project base without deep technical knowledge. We reversed both of them. A and that is we brought technical leaders back in to be the teachers back in our company who could actually look at work, validate it, and verify it was actually good, deep technical work because they had the experience to go along with that. And the only way that really worked is they were actually there with people. So they could actually look in and check their work. So for us, while we see great value out of the digital world and the opportunities to learn experience, we also think it's critically important that t people have to interact in their communities to work as teams. Otherwise, we can't produce reliable products, and all we have to do is look at the challenges we had on the 787, and where we were scheduled three years behind, we learned some tough lessons. And as we're going through huge transformational culture in our company, as I said, We'll change out 50,000 people in a span of three and a half years. We have to get the right culture in Boeing to be successful so our second century of flight is as successful as the first one. And so we're strong believers in deep technology, but also this interaction. That doesn't mean our kids can't communicate and interact, but when it comes to the team sport we're involved in, you got to be together. Okay, thanks everybody. I, I uh, failed in my one responsibility to keep us on time. We're running a few minutes late, but what a fantastic discussion. What great questions and what great panelists. Uh, thank you all for this. Hang on, hang on one second, guys. Chuck's got a few words. Just as we
close and before I thank Allie and the panel one more time, if you'll allow me two quick observations. One at the break, one of the real technology leaders of this nation said to me, you know what, I walked in here this morning totally depressed about the state of education. I am really excited. Second point, if you'll allow me, our colleague from Stanford said something that's really important. He said, you know, we're talking about the same set of questions we've been talking about for 50 years. That's right. And what that tells us is those are really important questions. But something has changed, and it's changed on a time scale of four or five years. We have a real market demand coming down the pike so fast that it's going to hit everybody like a ton of bricks. Rick has given you at least a little sense of that from, from one industry. We have a new upcoming generation of leaders in education and industry who have the courage to get out and do things differently and to measure the results and find out what works. And I think we would be remiss if we underestimated the role that IT is going to play. We are just at the beginning. We don't know where it's going to go, but it's going to be big. It's going to be important. And uh, for uh, Anand and Sal, frankly, I could care less about scale. You can have the biggest numbers you want. But if you think of it not as scale, but as reach, reach across society, reach around the world, this is new, and it's big, and it's very exciting because we're going to create opportunity for vast new numbers of, of young women and men coming up. So thank you very much for your patience for my two additional minutes. But please, again, thank the panel and thank Allie for the wonderful job he did. Lunch on the West Lawn.